Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Damn Media's sensational, conversational podcast. My name is not Colin Moriarty. I am the other more handsome, wiser, mm. yes, certainly much poorer Moriarty brother, <laughs> Dagster Moriarty. Good to see you. Now I'm joined as always by a cross section of LSM's most elite. You ask, would I say that about whoever happened to be on the show today? And the answer is honestly a resounding yes, but that's only because our lineup is stacked Mm -hmm. top to bottom, ladies and gents. Sorry, not sorry. However, this is a special group we have with us here today as each of these fine gentlemen happen to be the bastions of all the Last Damn Media video game specific podcasts. Well, Before we go around the horn and welcome these absolute heroes to today's proceedings, a little context for you guys. Colin and his bride are enjoying a little excursion up to Boston, a bit of a weekend vacay. So as New England wraps Colin and Micah in its warm embrace, we, the children, are left to our own devices. A bit of home alone, if you guys will. We have the run of this spacious house. Mom and dad have left the car keys. <laughs> Shades of joy rides. We get the bar downstairs in the finished basement with plenty of booze. <laughs> that sounds like... <laughs> hold on. That sounds like we're going to drink and drive. That's not, that's not going to happen, but we're going to have a great time. Anyway, good news and bad news. Colin is gone today, but he shall return next week. I leave it for you guys to decide which is the bad news and which is the good news. <laughs> now, let's meet our lovable cast of characters, a veritable who's who of podcasting talent. First, Dustin Furman, executive producer, co-host of Sacred Symbols, <laughs> co-host of Punching Up a Nintendo yeah. podcast. Dustin, welcome. Thank you. Wow. This is, I feel like this is eligent in some way. Uh, I mean, it's the Dagan Moriarty way. So first thing I was going to suggest, since Colin's not here and he's not going to listen to it, I was wondering if we could all go around and say the number one thing we dislike about Colin. Um, just, you know, this is our oh. opportunity. Let's do that. No, just kidding. Uh, no, Dagan, I was getting ready to do it. <laughs> yeah. He's not going to listen to it. He'll never know. The audience, they're going to be a snitch. Yeah, they're going to be a snitch. They're going to go. True. They're going to say something. Yeah. That's true. That Christmas bonus, say goodbye. It's not Ooh. happening if we do this. So <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, but I'm doing well today. I'm just hanging out. I uh, I got a package of some new merch stuff from Micah that we're going to debut at Sacred 300. So I'm excited about that. But in it, she sent me, she got Colin the G Fuel. Like they have these boxes that have the shakers and a G Fuel thing in it. That was Mega Man. But Colin didn't want the G Fuel powder. So I'm here oh. drinking my Gamer Fuel rush what? edition nice and it's flavored like a red slushy and oh yeah oh it's good yeah it's very good, it's good. you know lots of i have the I, mega man one i actually have that the blue one oh, yeah, same. okay yeah oh, that's so cool so you know a little know game little gamer fuel to kick off the afternoon oh, i drank one yesterday and i drank it really fast and i'm usually pretty good about caffeine but something about how m- quickly i drank it i could like feel it in my arms if that makes yeah. any sense, like I could yeah. feel a little. Sh- I was like, "Ooh, that was not good." Like Pre workout, pre workout. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you got tingles, dude. <laughs> I got a little bit of tingles. So uh, I'm just gonna slowly nurse this to keep my gamer energy up for this show. But good I'm very idea. excited to be here with you guys. Oh, this is a, this is quite a group. Dust, we're so happy to have you. Next, I'd like to introduce you guys to a man who needs no introduction. Noble master of summon sign. And the linchpin in the plot to overthrow Colin, the final ingredient needed in a coop 
in a coup to dispose a ruthless dictator and end an era of oppression. I'm not sure he knows that, but he knows now. Mr. Bradley Ellis. Welcome, my friend. Hey, thank you, mate. The Muster. That was your nickname, right? The other one? <laughs> the Muster. <laughs> I'll take it. I prefer Dagster, but Muster's in second. Well, you shouldn't have told me second. Muffin was your other nickname before. So now we just yeah. got to combine them. But yeah, it's a little heinous <laughs> to call you the Muster, I guess. It's we'll save so- that for special occasions. Okay, that's fair. I like that. I like that. I'm happy to have you on the crew. I mean, this is a great... Colin was going to be away. I feel like the spirit of this clan. I'm just feeling the energy, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm happy to have you here, Brad. Last, but certainly not least, legend of all things retro gaming and Xbox related, Mr. Maddie Plays. Welcome to the show, my friend. It's good to be here. Dagan, this is, uh, you've, you've, I think you're going to officially usurp Colin with this one. I think the, <laughs> I think the audience is going to love this. And I think you're going to have to start every show like this now. Like a I'm, I'm ready. Elegant welcoming of all the guests, even though everyone knows who we are, just treating us like royalty on the way in. This is wonderful. I, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. This is a definitely a special episode. When Micah told me when she was scheduling me in, she was just like, yeah, like no Colin. Like it's going to be you, you four. I was like, I was like, oh, this is a whole different dynamic. Like, let's, <laughs> like, I love talking to Colin. I was like, wait, this is going to be awesome. So. <laughs> I'm excited to be here and our, our range of topics are really good too. So, oh man, I'm excited. I'm so excited. It's a pleasure. And yeah, there's a little bit of a chaotic energy to it. It's like, it's like leaving the kids alone with the, uh, with the crazy uncle. That's what I feel mm. like. I feel like the crazy uncle right now. Like we definitely get up to no good. Love Dustin's idea about throwing Colin under the bus. We don't have to. We don't have if, to. If I'm we sprinkle it. it in throughout the show, we'll go unnoticed. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, Dust, speaking of Dust, we're gonna we we took a little round table, a little consensus prior to the show. We're gonna start with Dustin's topic because it's a timely one and it's a special one, and I know it's on the top of a lot of our minds. So, Dust, I kick it to you to uh, launch into this episode of Constellation with your topic today, sir. Awesome. Let's do it. So, yeah, this is an extremely topical to the point where I had gotten the email about what my topic should be, and I was thinking about it, and then. This happened, and I thought, well, with this lineup in particular, we got to do it. Um, And that is remembering Akira Toriyama. We just found out yesterday that he had passed away. I believe it said he actually passed away March 1st, so it's it. they had kind of waited a little bit. Mm. And um, yeah, it really, really sucks. This guy, Akira Toriyama, <laughs> I mean, arguably one of the most influential artists, uh, of all time, when you think of our modern media landscape from yeah. Dragon Ball, um, Dragon Quest, uh, uh, Chrono Trigger, of course, along with many other things. But um, yeah, I wanted to ask you guys how you were feeling about this. And and the main thing I wanted to ask you guys was how his work impacted you guys, because that was the the resounding thing that I was reading when people were reacting to this online was about how... This this one man, the ideas from his mind inspired them to become artists of their own or even just the inspiration to be. And I, it sounds cheesy, but I think it's true is that you can become something greater than what you are, um, particularly through, I mean, Dragon Ball. Uh, and that's really my main touch point. I mm. obviously have played Dragon Quest games. Um I, as we talked about on Punching Up Day, I've not played Chrono Trigger. Ooh. I bought it on Steam. I got it loaded on the Steam Deck. I was oh, like, this is the, loaded. This was a sign. This was a sign. Kiriyama, uh, uh, Akira Toriyama was saying, like, hey, you got to do this. So, yeah, I so I, I'll kick it off just by saying about how Dragon Ball, it wasn't my first anime per se, but it was the first thing anime that I watched that I gained the concept of what anime was. I remember I was either in kindergarten or first grade and there was a kid that was like, Hey, there's this show on Cartoon Network at this time. It's called Dragon Ball Z. You gotta check it out. It's, cr- it's crazy. I'm like, okay, well sounds cool. I'll, I'll check it out. And it was in the middle of the Frieza saga so Mm. i didn't have the traditional like and that's how it is when you know your kids you don't have access stuff it's just like whatever's playing on tv yeah and so 
getting in on Frieza was kind of chaotic, but also awesome that, I mean, the Frieza arc is, is amazing, but it really like captivated me immediately. And I've mentioned before in Constellation, my, my uncle, who is just a few years older than me, he's like three years older than me. So we got into Dragon Ball Z together. And I remember the level of obsession amongst all the boys in my class about Dragon Ball Z, where it was like we were going out at recess and pretend to do Dragon Ball Z moves like, you know, doing Kamehameha's and you're like pretending to do the super fast punches and stuff like that. <laughs> and how this like captivated us completely. And another interesting thing about during this time frame is that my one great uncle, um, so my mom's cousin. Yeah, I think that's great, uncle. Anyway, he was really into Dragon Ball Z. And I remember going to his house once and he was, you know, he was kind of more a traditional nerd. He lived in the basement. It was a nice finished basement. But mm. I remember him opening up those one of those big cabinets that had all the VHS and just was rows of these like really shitty labeled Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Z, whatever. Love it. I was like, whoa. How is this possible? He has Dragon Ball Z from the future now. <laughs> and I remember him telling me like, oh, yeah. And uh, after Dragon Ball Z is done, there's this show called they're, they're, they'll do Dragon Ball GT. I was mm. like, oh, my God. How is this? How is this possible? <laughs> I love that. Um, so obviously now, like knowing like he had some some bootleg stuff. Uh, <laughs> but I remember that just being mind blowing at the time. And I've mentioned a story, too, on I think Sacred about how Dragon Ball Z video games were so important as well, particularly um, the Game Boy Advance one, which is, is it the Path of Goku, Maddie? Legacy. Legacy, Legacy of, Goku. of Goku, yeah. Mm. Love that Playing some of that. Yeah. I don't think I owned it, but I think I had a friend let me borrow it, and I was like, oh, hell yeah. We, we always saw in magazines the Dragon Ball Z, or Dragon Ball GT Final Bout on PlayStation oh. 1. We never got it, but it was like Good. this mythical game. <laughs> and now knowing like it's it's terrible. I actually bought it a few weeks ago at a convention just because I was like, I got to own this now at some point in my life. Yeah. And uh, but the big one, the big one was Dragon Ball Z Budokai on PlayStation 2. Yes. And it was a magical Christmas for me because. Growing up, we I never caught on that my parents weren't very well off. They were really good at hiding it from me, but I kind of got the idea. It's like, okay, if there, it's a new game, it's not happening. Like once it's used, maybe we can figure it out. But this Christmas, I never had the expectation of getting Dragon Ball Z Budokai, but there, I, there it had, there was. I have a photo. I'm gonna have to see if I can find it and uh, put it in somewhere. But uh, a brand new copy of Dragon Ball Z Budokai and how amazing that was. It was, you know, the fighting game. It was like the the, the dream game for Dragon Ball fans. And uh, one last thing was I got in on Dragon Ball Z, but I always knew about Dragon Ball. And I remember getting a used season one DVD set of the original Dragon Ball. And I probably watched that at least 12 times, something like that. Um, and it really was this this particular show is what opened this gateway of like other shows that were light, like anime, right? So obviously, of course, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, but that really planted the seed at the time. And it's amazing to looking at all the how his work impacted so many other games. Uh, it's like it's or not even just games, anime, games, whatever the the, the impact is immeasurable really i was thinking about how uh i saw on twitter i follow this tomba fan account and someone was like <laughs> that exists yeah it's called tomba club and <laughs> they posted this art it was like thank you toriyama clearly a huge inspiration and i'm looking i'm like well no how did i never make this connection it's so mm. clear that tomba is so inspired by uh kira toriyama and and now in particular, I was remarking before the show started that I didn't have any Dragon Ball Z shirts anymore, but I wore this One Piece shirt because I was like, that's the closest thing I have. <laughs> it's not really close, but um, seeing One Piece and how correct, uh, how directly that has been inspired by Dragon Ball Z in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. um, Oda, the, the author of the manga, posted a really nice tribute to him the other day or yesterday on Twitter. But 
So yeah, it's a, it's a rare moment when a creator like this, it felt like last night, I guess just online, but uh, you know, Holly and I were talking about it. It's like kind of felt like time stops for a minute. And this was, it was so funny because it was like during the state of the union <laughs> that this That's came right. out. Now it's like <laughs> Kira Toriyama is trending number two, only second to the president of the United States. <laughs> That's the power of this man. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I want to see what you guys think about this, how you guys feel, how his work has impacted you. And, uh, Maddie, let's go to you first, just because I I feel like you're the most outward spoken. You remain true to Dragon Ball all this time yeah. because I haven't seen super. I know there's all like okay. movies and stuff like that. So I, I definitely fell out of of Dragon Ball, but always deeply respected it. But mm. you remain true. So how are you Indeed. feeling, Maddie? Maddie's got the Dragon Ball shoes, in fact. Yes, I did. <laughs> Which he talked about on an episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like my one time splurge. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm definitely, I, you know, I don't want to sound like too boastful, but I'm like a diehard Dragon Ball fan. Like I, I love absolutely this you so are much. Like that's I, clear. Yeah, I, I really do. And so yeah, last night was really sad to to learn what happened. And um, you know, I when I, I was just trying to recount, like you know where it started but for me I, I think it's just the visuals like i think it's easy to say you know there's a good artist out there but it's really hard i'm sure dig you can definitely get this like it's really hard to make a style that's wholly unique to the individual and that is what akira toriyama was like like there is something about dragon ball characters and how they appear uh like the way their eyes are done for example that is just so unique no one else can do that because if they do it's like that's a kira toriyama style mm. man and that's why when you see that art for chrono triggers box art uh, or the portraits or you see it in like dragon quest which is a series i got to get to like you you see it and and it always called my name but for a while growing up i'm like why and then you just recognize it's that style it's that undeniable style and i just think it, it's capture it's a, a unique character design that's captured me so much it, it's still to this day like i um i make a spreadsheet for for when i go to the gym and each workout it's a little cheesy but it gets me going is like every workout is like based on a character i really like in an anime effectively and obviously that's a lot of dragon ball characters because they're all shredded but there are pictures i had like i you know we consume so much media especially nowadays that sometimes things glance more than they probably should but with like a Dragon Ball character, like I have these pictures of Trunks where he's like sitting on the edge of a cliff, like holding his knee, like half his capsule corp jacket is off. He's got the black tank top, the the sword on his back. I'm like, this guy is so fucking cool. Like, it's unreal that someone made this. And like, I don't know if he would look right in any other style but this. And so it's it's that, right? And then, Dustin, you brought up video games. And, like, that was where my introduction to Dragon Ball was. Like, I never, you know, really connected well with TV uh, until much later in my life. But uh, my introduction to Dragon Ball was through Budokai. Like, you know, I was just this new anime fighting game with cool characters. And that's how I learned the story. In particular, my favorite is Budokai Tenkaichi 2. Um, the open world kind of presentation and uh, the amount of characters and how they just thoroughly comb through every arc. You know, that in particular was like my touchstone for Dragon Ball. And then I watched it afterwards. So I kind of did it in an unconventional way. But yeah, that would mark from that point on, really, I would get every Dragon Ball game that came out, uh, pass or fail. That means like even Ultimate Tenkaichi, which was not a good game. Like, you know, there was that adoration for the IP. That's just unwavering. Even to this day, uh, they just released the Dragon Ball Super Card Game Fusion World. It's a digital client, and I've been playing it. I've been really loving it. Uh, but I used to play it analog for, for those who don't play card games and don't know, like in person. And I played it in person for two years in the pandemic hit, shut down the local scene. One of the main reasons I got into it, I encourage people just to look it up. The art on the cards, granted, it's not done by Toriyama, but it's his characters, is fucking incredible. And I was ref that was the main thing I was reflecting on. I was, I'm like, this guy's art has driven me to his stuff year over year into my adulthood now. Um, so he's just a supreme talent that, that's going to be sorely missed for many reasons. But definitely, you know, I, I hope 
you know, he's impacted me in ways that I'm sure I, I, I'd still struggle to explain uh, just by like his characters and how much they've inspired me and, and just being a creative visionary and having that impact. Like that's all I've like, I, I dream of is like, Oh, I'd love to make something and have people be so moved by it that like, even though you've never met me, the passing impacts you in that way, in the way his did. So um, yeah, like the, the, it's crazy that there's still so much of his work. I really haven't experienced. And like, now I really want to approach that delicately knowing there's a limit to that. Um, you know, they, it was the saddest part of the post uh, that was on the Dragon Ball account was that it said he had countless other things in, in development still. Um, mm-hmm. So he had so much left going. And that means that a game like next month as we record this Sandland, I was already in because of the art style. And I was like, that's going to, it's kind of like, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like the Suicide Squad moment where Kevin Conroy passed away. And you're like, all right, this is like probably not the last, but one of the last Toriyama uh, hands-on pieces we're going to get. And in a video game format for sure. Uh, possibly the last and it, it you know it looks great it looks really unique and so you know that's going to be a little more i want to say emotional but it's going to hit a little different playing that just knowing you know it's one of the last remnants of of what he's left for us to enjoy uh and i know it's a you know an amalgamation of many people's efforts but obviously like his visuals really define i think the appeal of so many of the things he touches so yeah, I just I, I absolutely adore his work and, you know, like I, I need to experience more of it. Truthfully, like Dragon Quest is one like I see Brad, your poster in the background, like I have mm-hmm. Dragon Quest 8 on PS2. I remember playing it on a demo disc again because the art I was like, oh, this looks like Dragon Ball. Like that's, you know, it's awesome to see how far reaching he was, you know, like many people you look at like popular anime nowadays and they just, you know, not in a bad way. They all kind of look similar, though, and they stay in their little bubble like to be someone who made something so impactful that you went and, like heavily impacted video games and movies and stuff. it's just incredible like you can definitely put them up there with like Miyazaki I think like just that sort of talent well but, said um yeah I that that's pretty much where I, I really stand on it for now um you know I'd love to hear from from either Brad or Dagon on or how you guys feel about his passing and what his work meant to you Yeah, I'd love to kick this off to Brad. I mean, that Mm. notion, you know, it's one thing to lose the person, the human being, and that's sad, but that whole thing, letting that whole thing wash over you of like, all right, it's over. Like, we're never going to get another thing. And the the interesting thing about Sandland too, you know, you're talking about a manga that's nearly, what, 25 years old or something. Mm -hmm. And also speaking to how prolific he still was later in his 60s, you know, approaching 70 and yeah, his contributions and everything. I mean, I love the cross-generational sort of approach to this where you see how impactful this man was, regardless of age, like decades worth, generations worth. So Brad, that you'll be another one. It'd be great to hear from you and get your take on this. And um, you know, just how this guy was so impactful across media too, from manga to anime to video games and just it, it's not even really nerd culture. It's 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 pop. His pop culture impact mm-hmm. is enormous. I mean, second to none. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brad, take it away, my friend. Yeah, um, I remember. So I'm a little bit older. Not quite. I'm not as old. I'm old. I'm a little few years younger than Colin. So I remember right. how I was exposed to Dragon Ball is. Uh, Growing up, this was probably the mid 90s or early 90s. My brother had a friend who was half Japanese and he would go to Japan every summer to visit his grandparents. And when he would go, he would come back and bring back Dragon Ball Z like recordings from TV. So like a lot of the movies, like one of the first things I saw was like the uh, Cooler's Revenge or something, the movies. But we had watched these no subtitles. We would watch them off recording from TVs with all the great Japanese commercials and all that stuff. And that's kind of how I first got into Dragon Ball, because I don't know if it was really airing on TV really yet when I was watching it. But it that's like what kind of kickstarted my appreciation for anime, too. Also, it's just that was kind of the birth of it, because there was anime was really hard to get a hold of when we were young, when I was younger. It was very expensive, too, if you could find it. I had all of the original Dragon Ball, the first like season where I don't know how many VHSs that was, like seven or something. But I remember getting those at Suncoast Video and those were expensive, man. 
and I had the movie too. It was like Blood Diamonds or something, but I had that too. But those, so anime is really expensive. And I think Dragon Ball is what really helped bring anime to the West because it was a huge phenomenon, of course, in Japan, but eventually it started bleeding over here too. And I remember the games, especially, I remember that same friend, he had an adapter for Super Nintendo so you could plug, you could put a cartridge on top, then the Japanese Famicom game on top of that. So I was playing Dragon Ball fighting games on that and they were not good, but it was just cool because it was Dragon Ball. So everyone was hyped up. And it's funny, you guys talk about Budokai and that was like when it felt like a really good Dragon Ball game actually came out. So that was a huge touchstone moment. Yeah, of course, and Cartoon Network started airing it blew up Mm. and that was great. I love that. But I do think about like his just impact on stuff I love, like so much manga I love, like all the manga... Like all of Shonen Jump, like One Piece, Naruto, all those big things, Bleach, they wouldn't be what they are without Dragon Ball Akira Toriyama. He is like the grandfather of all that kind of stuff. So his impact on manga there is like probably the biggest person ever, I would say, in manga terms. In anime, he's up there also. Dragon Ball, of course, is huge. Still huge after what, like 30 years? It's still going strong. Like I've seen videos I remember in like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Dragon Ball is really big in like uh, South America and all that stuff and like Mexico. Yeah. And they're like advertising Dragon Ball Super episodes like they're real fights and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty rad. But of course, seeing his work kind of bleed over into video games, of course, was like a match made in heaven. When I was younger. Chrono Trigger, of course, seeing that for the first time, you're like, whoa, it is. This guy looks like Goku on the box. This is awesome. And of course, Dragon Quest. It's so good. His work carrying on. And it's still how prevalent he is today. And pop culture is so fascinating to me. Like he somehow stayed consistent for so many years. It's kind of remarkable how much his uh, work is still a part of pop culture today. And I'm just so thankful for all of his awesome talent that he gave us. It, it's great. It changed so many lives like mine. It changed probably everyone's life here. So it's a real bummer to see him go too young, man. It's really sad, especially because he had so much more work to go. Like, Hopefully, like for Dragon Quest 12, a lot of his work's done already because I can't wait to see what he's got cooking for all that. Of course, his character designs are legendary. So I'm bummed to see him go, but I'm really thankful for what he put out there. I just want to celebrate his work, I guess, and the impact he had on everyone else. Like one piece of Naruto, man. It's just like he is those two guys, Oda and Kishimoto. They love they loved uh, Toriyama. So I'm just so happy for all the great stuff he got to give us and how much it affected everyone's life in a positive way. So yeah, sad to see him go, but his work will live on. Thankfully. Yeah. Well said that body of work and yeah, his profound impact on other famous mangaka and you could see it in their work. You know what I mean? It's so obvious and it's so, it it occurs to me like back then with Enix and, and Dragon Quest and eventually with Chrono Trigger and Squaresoft and everything It's how great of a strategy was it to align with Akira Toriyama to do your art? I mean, he, who, what mangaka, what famous artist has more of a, you know, name that tune in two notes style? Like Maddie mentioned Miyazaki and Toriyama is the pinnacle of that. You know, you Mm -hmm. think of other guys with, or girls with a really distinctive flavor to their art, Rumiko Takahashi, Katsuhiro Otomo. Miyazaki, I would I would say the other big one was Toriyama, where mm-hmm. it's like you know immediately in a couple of br- a couple of brush strokes or a couple of lines on the page who drew that. So distinctive. And you know what the other thing about just from a drawing perspective, he has such a huge impact on me, and maybe I'll be able to get to that. But um he the thing about his work is that he drew everything well. He was a great character designer, he was great at environments and landscapes interiors, the mech, the tech, the way he drew cars, the way Mm -hmm. he drew weapons. He was just such a brilliant draftsman. And then you combine that with this completely unique style that does sort of involve the graphic nature of anime, but it's his own interpretation of everything. It's very, very beholden to just his, his hand and his mind and such a unique flavor of art and being able to enjoy that across, you know, the written page, the printed page and cartoons and video games. I mean, 
this one really stings. I mean, this uh, it's so nice to be able to sit here with you guys and give him a proper timely eulogy. I think I was up to like 2.30 in the morning yesterday, just kind of letting it sink in. And it, it's like, where do you even start with a guy like this? I mean, I'll tell you where it started for me and I'll give you my old man perspective because it was even before Dragon Ball. So gather around children. I got my Jaffe pipe here. Oh. <laughs> I'll tell you, tell you a little story. <laughs> So where it's so interesting to think back of where Toriyama started for me because I was 16 years old. I remember it very vividly. I had my first part-time job that my parents were like, you're in 10th grade, you got to go work. So I worked at the supermarket and I pulled a couple of day shifts at night every week. So weekdays, I would work like a five to nine shift. But the thing I hated was Saturday morning, I had to go to the supermarket super early and I worked like an eight to three shift. So I had to get there super early and I rode my bike and it was like a 35 minute trip to get my bike there. And so I would have to wake up and eat breakfast and slowly get, get, a, you know, get my druthers and get my clothes on and everything. But this cartoon started airing. I wish I remembered what network it was, but I think it was one of the big three at the time, whether it was CBS, NBC or ABC. Don't quote me. But there was a cartoon that we knew in the West as Dragon Warrior that mm. Saban Entertainment sort of imported. In Japan, of course, it was Dragon Quest Legend of the Hero Abel, which was based on the Dragon Quest games. I think the anime specifically was based largely on Dragon Quest 3, but I think it was sort of an amalgamation of Dragon Quests 1 through 4. Now, we already had Dragon Warrior for NES in the States. I think that came in in 89-ish, but it was completely off my radar. I, had, I still had never played an RPG or a JRPG. So this was like 1990. And this cartoon came on television at like six in the morning on Saturday mornings. And I would wake up religiously for it at like 5.50, get downstairs, wipe the sleep out of my eyes and just watch this cartoon for a half hour before I had to get ready for work. And it was my first exposure to Akira Toriyama. And th back then it felt to me like I knew it was dubbed. It was called Dragon Warrior. I didn't know the video game parallel yet, but it was an extension of the anime that I knew from TV growing up, starting with Gotcha Man and Voltron and Robotech. So it was like, oh, this is another thing. I knew enough at 16 in 1990 that this came from Japan. And still, if you got, I know for a certain period, it was very hard to get a hold of this series. Again, Dragon Quest, Legend of the Hero, Abel. Um, I think it went for seasons. I think there was some sort of falling out with the cartoon production from Toriyama's end. But of course, you look at it and you know it's his character designs. I don't think he worked on it for the entire run of the show. And then right after that is when I discovered... Dragon Ball, when I started going to not anime conventions at that time, it was comic book conventions. And there was an anime presence there, like anime pirate guys that would dump laser discs onto pirated VHS. And I remember even back then, these VHS guys, this early sort of, this early presence of anime in the West, like even then, like 25% of their inventory was Dragon Ball. Like a certain large percent of the VHS and the manga and the art books and the posters and the merch was already Dragon Ball. Like it was already established as this big chunk of it before Toonami, before Sci-Fi Network, before all that stuff. And then it was so cool because then it was a really rapid succession of just discovering, okay, this man's behind all this crazy shit. Started with the cartoon, the Dragon Quest cartoon rolled into discovering Dragon Ball and saying, okay, that's the same guy. Then discovering, okay, Dragon Warriors, Dragon Quest. It was like this epiphany moment. And then, of course, Chrono Trigger, not too lo long after that. And then this thing of this guy, and then going back and discovering the back catalog, like, hey, this guy's been around since the mid to late 70s. I think he had his first serialized manga in Shonen Jump in like 76 or 77 and discovering, oh my God, this guy's already been around for decades, that type of thing. And being able to go back and, dis and research and discover. I have a book here that I highly recommend. I only got this like last year, maybe two years ago. It's manga theater. Oh. And it's sort of the more obscure, at least in the West, manga 
that he's done. Wonder Island is in here. Tomato, the QT Gumshoe, Chobit, uh, Gogo Ackman. And it's so crazy to see some of this stuff. If you guys look, this book, by the way, is like a value at quadruple the price. But you could see like things like this were like the precursors for trunks. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. it's Definitely. pretty in like his wow. right. Like he was already that aesthetic was already so dialed in wow. and cool. But yeah, so it's it's a it's a crazy crazy loss. It's one of those things that you think about from time to time, and it's like wow, when he goes, that's gonna be you know like a little a little piece of my heart is gonna go too. And again, it's it's also grieving that thing of you know what it's over. Like we'll never get another thing from his hand, you know, but his influence, his impact will be lasting. And you know what the other thing I want to say about Toriyama, for me personally, when I started to develop, well, I've always been very interested in animation and cartoons. And I've always been very influenced by everything that came out of of Japan specifically, even as a little kid, before it was easily identifiable and before, you know, before I could articulate and before you get a hold of this stuff, I always, there was always a draw for me to the flavor of anime and manga. But as I got older and I realized, okay, this is for real, like I'm going into animation. This is my primary, you know, career interest and this is happening. I was always really comforted by Toriyama. I appreciated him as a fan, but as an animator, there was something, there was almost something in his work that gave me permission to be cartoony. I was more inclined of a cartoony sensibility in my work. I always really admired the guys that could draw the super realistic comic book figurative stuff, but it just wasn't my cup of tea. And I remember going through periods when I was younger in my teens and my early 20s where I felt insecure about that. It was like, I don't really draw like that. There's not this sort of very anatomy-based, skillful, even if you think of like Disney feature animation, like I would never be able to animate Belle or Pocahontas or something like that. This is not my cup of tea. I'm much more cartoony, much more drawn to that. I think that's where my talents lie. And when I discovered Akira Toriyama, and saw how cartoony he was. Yes, very well drawn, brilliant draftsman, could draw anything, 10 times more talented than I'll ever be, maybe 100 times. But there was something in his work that gave me the permission, in not so many words, to be like, okay, I could be cartoony. I could be influenced by anime, but not draw exactly like that. You know, the the limit of detail, the fact that you don't have to draw an immense amount uh, you don't have to draw every every freckle. You don't have to draw every wrinkle. There's something cartoony. There's something fun. And just a, a great combination of badass and cute. You know what I mean? Like it, it just has everything. You know, that style just has everything. That aesthetic, it just, it's just kind of everything that you want to see, everything that entertains you all rolled into one. So that was the big personal takeaway for someone like Toriyama where it was like, I could relate. I could relate to his style and I saw his influences and obviously he came out of this old generation of Tezuka and Monkey Punch and all these other guys. But I think he took it to a level that few have taken it to, you know, not only as as a master, but just as kind of reining his impact down. I remember when Street Fighter 2 hit Western arcades, let's say in the spring, maybe certainly by the summer of 92, I remember thinking, oh my God, like this character, Ryu and Ken, they're throwing fireballs. That's a, that wasn't, it was Dragon Ball. You know what I mean? We thought it was the Capcom characters, but it wasn't, it was Dragon Ball. And again, that was in that frenzy, that flurry of just discovering this guy and the way his impact was already woven into the fabric of everything, you know, and this is 92. I mean, this is like years and decades ago. You know, so it's a it's a it's an amazing loss. I'm so glad the Sandland game is coming out. That's a really interesting thing and sort of a blank, sort of a, a dark spot and a blank area for me as far as Toriyama goes, because there's, there's a lot of the manga I'm not caught up on or even familiar with. And, you know, I think it's nice to have those things. He was so prolific, he did so much work over the years 
it would be hard to catch up to everything. It's going to take years and years to catch up to everything, even though it stopped yesterday. So that's comforting to know there's still a lot to discover there, at least for me, where it's like, you know, there's, um, there's a lot there still to explore. And uh, I think that's really cool. Yeah. I, uh, the one other thing I just want to touch on, and then we can open it up to any other final thoughts is um, I did touch on this a little bit earlier, but I don't, I want to make sure it's uh, clearly stated how important I think Goku was and continues to be as a character for so many reasons. But um, cause yeah, we, we've, I mean, obviously the art is the, is, is the highlight of everything he's done, but just also the, the characters and the story as well. Think about Goku. Um, I was thinking like, now I wonder if there's certain morons in a modern day lens that would try to say he's like a Mary Sue type character that is just like this good guy that is, doesn't do anything wrong or anything like that. And, and I'm not I'm not like fully up on my Dragon Ball lore. So maybe someone is going to say, actually, Goku did this bad thing or something. And I'm sure that's probably the case. But the lasting impact of Goku for me was just like, here's a guy who is truly good. He cares for his friends. He cares to save people. And even the two level two, like he is this like this super awesome family man, too, that has kids that he cares about and trains and. Um, as basic, I guess, of, or not basic, but as stereotypical of a role model that is, he was the role model that we needed um, mm. growing up, <laughs> you know? Um, cause like everyone That's wanted well to be said, like, Goku. He's, he's very Superman like in that mm-hmm. he's very virtuous, but Toriyama did have those characters, but he had characters with a lot more dimension too, whether it's Vegeta or Piccolo or Trunks or Gohan was always one of my favorites who was just kind of living in his dad's shadow, that type of thing, which I think was, Mm -hmm. but you're right. I mean, but, and and, I mean, shout out to the slime, right? One of the most iconic, I would almost put the Dragon Quest slime up there with Mickey Mouse or Mario. Like it's pretty close. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Superman. Superman can get fucked compared to Goku, in my opinion. <laughs> Amen. I hear like, you on that. Yeah. I uh I don't know. It's hard to even put into words just like how how like yeah. I'm glad you brought up too the the dimensionality of the the other characters sure. as well. Um because man, like, dude, Piccolo Piccolo, maybe second to Goku in coolness, but in a totally so cool different way. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, uh, growing up, everyone wanted to be like Goku, and I think that's a great thing for uh, my generation. But I don't know. Is there any other closing thoughts, Brad or Maddie or, or Dig? Like, uh, uh, I just wanted to echo oh, something that Dig said that I really didn't think about, but he put so well, is um, you talked about drawing everything well. And, you know, it's funny because, like, I have to see a lot more Miyazaki movies before I firm up this opinion, but like I've yet to see anything from him that I'm like, Oh my God, I love that. That was so good. But I get why people like the movies. Cause it, the world has these little details. Like the backgrounds are very animated, like I, watching the boy in the hair. And this is like a really weird example, but mm. stuff that they would typically clip away, like him putting on his pants and like putting on his shirt, like these little things that give these characters life. I'm like, okay. Like, it's those little world details that I feel people like from the Miyazaki movies where he just leaves nothing untouched effectively. Um, But I've never connected hard with that. But Dag pointing out like the cars, the technology, like I think a capsule corp, right? Like I think of Mm -hmm. like, you know, they take this little capsule, they throw it down and a a big time travel machine pops out. And I'm like, that just gets my brain going in a particular direction. Like the way he approached technology even was so novel and um it had because like dragon ball is supposed to be this very old world but then you go to somewhere like west city it's very like new and somewhat like futurama like futuristic like it's it's really strange it's a strange world uh where you know you could feel sort of the creative freedom of like i kind of don't want to just make like this old school you know tribal kind of thing i want to make like a futuristic city I want to add time travel. And he just like for, for a while found a way. It's funny hearing you bring up Dustin, like 
Goku's kind of father figure like behavior because there's this huge debate now with like Dragon Ball Super and Dragon Ball Z in tow that like Goku's just a horrible father. <laughs> really? Okay, I was worried about that. Oh, yeah, no. I figured in the spirit of fairness, I just alert Please. you. It's a debate though, because because like some people, you know, you think about like what Goku did to his kid with with the cell arc, where he's like, "Hey, dude, you've got this. I'm dead." <laughs> um, and he kind of just sends him out to the wolves, or letting Piccolo take him and train him for the for the uh, Saiyan saga. Um, but then also, yeah, they, they talk about like his neglect and all that. It, it's it's a really interesting story. And there are like video essays like Goku is actually a good father or a bad father. It's it's crazy. But I mean, I guess that really does speak to the adoration and interest people have in these characters and that he's still important nonetheless. And he definitely is, uh, resembles something special. But yeah, for me, favorite character, because you guys were mentioning that earlier. I think now, it, I mean, Trunks is definitely my favorite, but. Oh, Trunks, dude. Yeah, Trunks oh, is just so freaking cool. I'll never forget the moment when he comes out of the, is it like the hyperbolic time thing? Chamber, yeah. The, yeah. Oh, yeah, hyperbolic time chamber. He comes out, and it's like he's been in there for a year, and he's just like radiating energy. Yeah. Man. That, no, my favorite moment for Trunks was his introduction. He, You spend this whole arc watching Goku go to all the lengths to take out Frieza, right? Oh, yeah. High stakes <laughs> shit. Next arc starts, freezes back to, you know, they like all detect his energy. They're like, yo, we got to go. That's Frieza again. They go. You see Frieza dust King Cold. You're like, all right, he's stronger than ever, too. And then Trunks just steps out of the machine and fucking rinses this guy, cuts him in the bits, blasts him in away. Seconds. And he's like, hey, so there's something much worse than that waiting for us in the future. I was like, yo, this guy is awesome. Yeah, yeah, him and then I think Vegeta long term, like if especially when you get into Dragon Ball Super, I think Vegeta's like the best current character. Like he's just because <laughs> he's not godlike. He he's he's still climbing the ladder effectively. Like Goku. Mm, that's right? a good way to put yeah, it. Goku doesn't lose. He's got like ultra instinct, but Vegeta's still climbing that ladder. And um you can feel that like because like they tease something at the end of was it Broly or was it super I think it was superhero. They tease at the end that they were training Goku and Vegeta, and Vegeta finally won. They haven't built on that yet. But yeah, it's just uh, the kind of ongoing progression that, uh, you know, we know Dragon Ball will continue still. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just these characters mean so much. And it was nice to be able to talk about them a lot. I mean, you remind me of something with Dragon Ball specifically and why it's so masterful. It's it's really a masterclass in the slow build and the payoff. That's the huge badass payoff. That's worth it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And sort of has that rhythm and really kind of was one of the first things to establish that flavor, you know, a very Eastern flavor in the West. You know what you guys also remind me of when I discovered Toriyama in general, I was 16. I was already too old to pretend I was these characters, although I definitely wanted to, right? <laughs> but watching you guys and the younger generations, it was the first like non-mainstream Marvel DC, you know, sort of comic book superhero characters you know that the western world embraced like we grew up with superman and batman and you know my sisters wanted to be wonder woman this was the first manga anime thing for me really honestly i mean soon it was followed by things like pokemon soon it was followed for, by things like digimon and other stuff power rangers but really dragon ball might have been one of the first where i saw little kids running around acting like Goku. And I was like, all right, there's hope. You know, mm -hmm. there's hope for, for American children. They have good taste. <laughs> you know, I was old enough to already judge from that perspective. And you know, I'll sum up, I'll sum up, you guys have to end it how you want, but I'll sum up Toriyama like this with his drawing. Not only was he just masterful at drawing, but there's a, when you guys think of your favorite comic book artists, either Western or Eastern, you know, there's, always, there's sometimes often I would argue a sense of like, okay, I'm going to draw all my badass characters and their hero poses on this spread. And all right, I guess I got to draw the background in here too. There was a joy in, with Toriyama in the world building of drawing everything. Like he had fun drawing everything in its entirety. And that sense of fun, I think, translates. That genuine sense that he was having a good time drawing everything from soup to nuts is very rare and and really not having a weakness, by the way. It's like he was good at drawing the entire thing, the entire kit and caboodle. 
And I think that's, that shows not only an insane work ethic, especially when you're doing like serial Shonen Jump manga that's due like week in and week out, but just shows an insane dedication and joy in his craft that, and I think that's why it's so comforting. You know what I mean? It's like this guy was genuinely having a, was he a millionaire? Yes. Many times over, but he was having a good time. Mm -hmm. This is what he loved to do. This was his passion. And uh, to a to a rare degree, can you see that? And and it, it, he's a rare beast in that sense, you know, because it transcends talent. There was something was like this is what this man was put here to do. Yeah, very well yeah. said, Brad. Did Goku, you? You're the yeah. Goku uh, I didn't is know if you had any the final. he is the Super Mario of manga and anime. He is mm. a household name. He is a legend. Everyone respects Goku. And if you don't. Yeah. Sort your life out, all right? <laughs> Goku's awesome. Get there. Yeah, like my my grandma knows Goku. Exactly. I feel like yeah, everyone does at this point. That's it. Now, I guess one last thing that just popped in my mind I wanted to ask you, Maddie. Do kids these days care about Dragon Ball? Mm. Or is it kind of faded for stuff like My Hero and That's a really uh, good Slayer? question because I, I yeah, that's a really good question cuz Anytime like I've met another Dragon Ball fan or when I was playing like the Dragon Ball card game analog, granted really small community, but it was all people my age. Um, yeah. I feel like Super was extremely popular. Super was kind of questionable in its storytelling. Like Z definitely had really good storytelling, but by Super, you understand like, oh, no one really dies and like there's no right. real stakes here. Right. Like someone's going to get wished back and um. Like I'll take for example, I won't spoil anything, but like the end of the like the Goku Black arc in Dragon Ball Super is really good, and then the ending, it's like, why? Like you just under, <laughs> you just you just pulled the rug out from everything you had just built. But, um, that's from like a, a young adult perspective. But when I look at Dragon Ball, like I don't see many kids wearing that gear. But I I feel like it's got to be relevant. It's like it's in Fortnite. Like it's being sold constantly they're doing spin-offs like the fact that they could do an adidas cross promo like it has a massive base it's still being made to this day but like a good a, a better barometer is like when i went to the theater and uh to watch dragon ball super broly or dragon ball super superhero mostly people my age or older like that that that's kind of it feels mm -hmm. like the target audience for yeah. dragon ball now and i'll be interested to see with daima coming out at the end of this year you know how how that fares like, you know, how people uh, enjoy that and if that connects to a younger audience, because that's more of like the connecting with the the original Dragon Ball, like everyone's small and kind of chibi like. So, yes, we'll see. But super I don't actually different. know if it's super popular with the with the kids nowadays. I, I imagine so just because they sell so many games and and manga and and movies and stuff i mean it makes stupid money now so much money that i think that's why they really haven't made like they're supposed to be more dragon ball like super is not just the end of the story like there's so much more to do like the yeah. manga is still going um yeah right and so yeah. it's just like they they make so much money off that ip that they've just stopped that and just kind of do what they want when they want these movies kind of just came out of nowhere. I thought like, oh, we were going to get Broly and then transition to the show. Nope. <laughs> They're like, here's another movie. So uh, it's a good question. I've never really thought much about it because like, you know, when I make videos on Retro Rebound, like my target audience are people my age and right. everyone's like, yeah, I remember picking up like Budokai from Game uh, GameStop or uh, from from Blockbuster. So, yeah, it's always people like our age or a little bit. Yeah, older. Dustin, I think I mean, I have a 13 year old. I could tell you he knows it. But he's completely apathetic. Mm. You know what I mean? I think, well, well, what was the thing? What was the anime in the West that ran with the Dragon Ball baton? Was it Naruto? Was that really the next big yeah, thing? Naruto yeah, Naruto yeah. seized the fan base. So mm -hmm. I think with his, we, you know what though? It's funny. He opens Fortnite. Now he sees Dragon Ball stuff on my shelf and my trunks vinyl uh, figure and all that kind of stuff, my garage kits and stuff, but he doesn't really know it, know it. Mm. He may be special in that he just sees it around my office and stuff. But it, certainly when he opens Fortnite, he's not confused by who Goku is or right. whatever the other skins that, you know, or your characters you could play as. But that is interest. That is a really interesting thing. Like kids now in their adolescence or teens, but, but maybe this new series will usher that interest back in and in the cyclical fashion where it could be timely 
to sort of wrangle in a generation like he's been doing since the seventies, which is crazy. Like there, there's no end to it. Yeah. It's pretty, that, that staying power is insane. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I do think Demon Slayer is kind of taken over as like, the, it's funny because it's one of my favorites now, but like Demon Slayer is definitely like a favorite amongst a younger generation for sure. sure. Mm. Yeah. But it's over. Dragon is it Castle. done? Yeah. The story's over. I didn't know that. As far as I'm aware. Yeah. Oh, wow. I read it all. It's really good. Really, really good. Mm-hmm. Dragon Ball will never die. <laughs> Let's just keep yeah, going. Dragon Ball can no, go. I, don't, I can't see an end to it. <laughs> cool. Well, I guess that's uh I guess that's a good place to to wrap that. But yeah, thank you, Kira Toriyama, for everything. You'll be mm-hmm. greatly missed. And we're excited to see, man, those final few things. Dragon Quest 12, Brad, you brought up. Mm-hmm. I think good all point. eyes mm-hmm. are going to be on yeah. that. It's kind of going to be, I don't know. It's hard to say how much he has done, but it will certainly feel like a swan song, I think, yeah. when it comes mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. So Agreed. Well done, Dust. Yeah. And there'll be new legend and legends in the manga and anime and amazing manga co-working today. And there'll be new legends that come along. We have our existing ones, but the landscape is never going to be quite the same. There's going to be a little chip missing that you can't fix. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's that's the impact, my friends. Yeah, yeah, I am curious to see, last thought, naming him. I'm yeah, curious sure. to see who follows up Dragon Ball with a Dragon Ball inspired thing. By that, I mean like, I, I think it's Jujutsu Kaisen. Like that is clearly inspired by Naruto. I'm just wondering, like, okay, what is going to look at Dragon Ball and like take it and try to evolve it and animate it and make the thing that they were inspired by as a kid, pretty much? Part of my dogs. Um, That's a great point, Maddie. Yeah, I wonder who's going to like, because you mentioned baton passing. I kind of flipped the switch in my head where I'm just like, who's going to do the next Dragon Ball, if you will? I know Toriyama has a small, a relatively small staple compared to a lot of other famous mangaka, but he has some protégés and that could be the answer. You know what I mean? The people that are already helping Mm -hmm. in the trenches. Um, Because you don't, you know, through osmosis, you know, how talented, how how skillful these people are getting just from being around this man day in and day out must be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my friends. Well, you, you did that justice and I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all three of you. Now, listen, I thought, if you don't mind, Brad, love Mm -hmm. your topic. Would love to jump over to you next and uh, take it away when you're ready. Yeah, sure. So my topic is just amusement parks in general. You know, growing up in Southern California, I'm in like a mecca, I would say, of amusement parks. You know, of course, we have Disneyland. (laughs) We got Universal Studios. We got knott's berry farm we got six flags we got a lot of great amusement parks around here and i it was just something i grew up going to a lot like i remember when i was very young and it was affordable my entire family we had disneyland passes and it was just great because disneyland is like 20 something minutes from my house so we would just go like on a sunday or something like that just as a family I was there like when Indiana Jones, the ride opened up and i remember just standing in line how far back the line went it was just crazy and as I was getting older, you know, going as I started like roller coasters more being into like Six Flags and stuff like that, I mean, it was kind of far, but like just all the crazy loops and stuff. It just like the the idea of going into the music park, this fun land, this fun environment, I guess, where you can get really horrible food for you, but tasty. Go on this concept of rides, you know, and just the quality levels of what they offer like uh Knott's Berry Farm had like a ghost town, a big part of it. And I remember there was a train you could ride on and people would rob the train bandits and stuff like that. And I remember my brother shot one of them with a squirt gun when we were really little. So that was awesome. <laughs> That's great. But yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like what everyone's thoughts are. Cause like, I don't know a lot about amusement parks outside of, you know, the big ones like in Florida, of course, has Disney World and stuff like that. But like other states, like what you guys went to, like Pittsburgh and stuff like that or New York, what you guys would do. So, yeah, just kind of want to give everyone's thoughts and like your experiences with the amusement parks. I have, what do you think? Take it away, my friend. You go first. Oh, man, I've got, I feel like I've got so much to say. So I might ramble for a few here because I love please. Brad. That was one of the things we talked about quite a bit when we first started hanging out and playing uh, 
uh, Monster Hunter together. Yeah. I was always talking about going to amusement parks. So mm. uh, growing up, our amusement park in the Pittsburgh area is Kennywood, which is an iconic classic park. Um, no, they have some. I don't know if it's some of the oldest wooden, but probably, yeah, there's some that were made in like 1930. I think there's some some old classics there. And so I remember growing up and going to Kennywood. Uh, I in particular remember that going once with my grandma and she had no she didn't realize that some of these rides that she took me on would scare the shit out of me for years to come. <laughs> there was a an old mine ride where they had this giant spider look like it was going to come down onto the cart. And uh, that permanently damaged me for a long time. Uh, but overall, having an amazing time going to Kennywood. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my only experience for a long time until weirdly enough, when I was in second grade, uh, my uncle was living in France uh, for a while. So we went to visit him and I went to Euro Disney. Whoa. And so that was that's the only time I've ever been to a, a Disney park was ironically in Paris. <laughs> so I was kind of scared because I wanted to ride Space Mountain, but it was the first really real feeling roller coaster that I'd ever gone on. And that was uh, a a transcend transcending moment for mm. me with mm -hmm. roller coasters where I was like, oh yeah, this this rules. I'm I'm very much into this. And it wasn't until a few years later that I went to Cedar Point, which is arguably I mean some people would say it's the the best roller coaster park in the world. Um it's at least in the top three or five depending on who you ask no matter what and uh just being so into roller coasters in general particularly at cedar point at the time um the big ride was millennium force which is still there today just this giant blue roller coaster that uh so cedar point sits on a pen peninsula that goes mm -hmm. into lake erie and when you're going up Millennium Force, it's right along the coast. So as you're going up, you just see Lake Erie all out and you can see the oh, entire park. It's amazing. It's such a beautiful. cool ride. And uh, so, yeah, being really into going to Cedar Point for for many years. And it wasn't until this, this past like two or three years that I've kind of gone crazy going to as many <laughs> amusement parks as I can on this side of the country. Um. So just last year, I went to Hershey Park for the first time uh, after too many games. I went there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And that was awesome. I went one time when I visited Colin. We went to is it a King's Dominion. Yeah. Which is right near Colin where Colin lives. Yep. So I went to that as well. And then also been to a pretty jank park, uh, which is Six Flags Great America. And it was not so good. Like half the rides broken. You go to eat somewhere and like half the tables were dirty. It was not a good experience, but it was still cool riding roller coasters. Of course. Which and, one was that dust? What state? Uh, Maryland. Oh, OK. Never yeah. Been. So it's kind of like D.C., Baltimore area in, okay. in that uh, neck okay. of the woods. So I think that's great, America. Dustin, can I ask yep. you about. The I guess I guess the production or the theming of the parks or anything like that, were they high? I think of Disneyland, of course, insanely high production value, high ass budget, yeah. everything. And that's like, of mm -hmm. course, nothing could be like those those parks. But I'm just curious, how were how are they those parks that you went to? Like. Yeah, so it's interesting because Cedar Point. It's not a theme theme park like Disneyland, obviously. Right. Um, but there are there's a really weird themed like Western area of the park. That's kind of the the last third area of the park is this. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called. So when you're in that area, it's awesome. Like there's all of mm -hmm. these buildings that are like very traditional, like just wood slab buildings, you know, 
and uh they've got cool stuff like you can watch someone do like glass blowing <laughs> in that area which Sick. i always like if it's too we're like all exhausted and tired we'll go like sit and watch someone make something in a class and stuff like that and so some of the rides in that area too particularly like maverick and steel vengeance that's their one of their newer rides are all themed and there's actually like a lore behind these different rides that mm. they'll have like these uh big posters and signs up where you can read like this fake lore about these companies that made these rides and (laughs) not made the rides, but like had these different mining companies and stuff like that. But, and then other parts of the park, there's theming per ride. Mm -hmm. I would say like dragster, uh, which they had to close because a part flew off and hit a lady in the head, nearly oh, killed her. No, what? Uh, yeah, shit. this happened a few years ago. Uh, something in the dragster, their hydraulic system. So the ride queue is in the center of the dragster because the dragster is just basically a loop that would shoot you straight up and then fall back down and then go in a loop. It was amazing. Go like 90, I think it was like 90 or 100 miles an hour in like four seconds. Holy, it was insane. Holy shit. Uh, but yeah, a piece flew off, hit a lady. They had to close it down. And so it's reopening this year with a new system that's much safer. And they're adding a new element or something like that. But so, yeah, that area is all racing themed and stuff. Okay, so cool. I didn't really get to experience true theming outside of Disneyland until I went to Universal Japan. Right. Where, yeah. dude, the theming. Higher budget for sure. On point. I mean, obviously... Dagan, we talked about this bunch on punching up, but Nintendo Land, uh, mm-hmm. probably the most amazing theming I've ever seen. Sounds so period. Cool. But also the Harry Potter section, the Wizarding yeah. World section, the the detail that came that was so cool to me. And just because I had heard about it in a video, so I really tuned into it, is that they really took extra care. And apparently this was like from the top from J.K. Rowling that she didn't want it to feel like you were in a theme park version of, you know, Hogwarts or something. So there's no Coke branding. In fact, they even go so far that the cash registers, they hide, they like put a, 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 like a cloth over them when they're not in use and they try to hide it. They don't want any muggle stuff <laughs> that they can keep that have around that makes it feel kind of take you out. And it's, Love it's that. effective. It really really works so yeah the theming is is um a fun element and something i enjoy but i've always been mostly a a rides guy to the point where even these last few years kind of become kind of nerdy about it and have been Mm -hmm. watching like youtube videos that are like roller coaster enthusiast guys they're like oh yeah this ride this is an intamin ride or this is a rocky mountain construction roller coaster and this is where they have all these different rides you can see how this was the first one they made and how they evolved into this ride. And it's a, there's a whole like sub community about roller coasters. That's been really fun to get into and watch. But at this point there, I, there is not any roller coaster that I won't ride. I'm I'm not freaked out by any of them. The one ride that did kind of get me was at that six flags park. That was bad is a Batman ride where they strap you in and there's these weird cloth harnesses. And the reason they do that is that you actually are suspended like downward. So You're it's like dangle, the ride's right? holding yeah. you. Right. In. Right. Yeah. And I, I would, I mean, I would ride it again, but I felt highly <laughs> uncomfortable. I was like, I don't like the feeling of this ride just holding me as I'm suspended by it. It was a little, little off-putting but (laughs) but yeah it's been great and it's been a cool thing for holly and i to bond together because she's super into roller coasters also and she'll ride anything as well and so over the last few years yeah we've gone to all these parks together and and ridden everything together and the the thing i'll end on um because there's so many different things i could say is just uh when we went to king's dominion uh it was either last summer or the summer before there's a ride there called Intimidator 305, and it is a notorious ride uh, that when it was originally built the, the during the off season, they had to change it because immediately after the first hill, it banks to the right hard 
and nearly everyone was at the very least graying out and often blacking out on this ride. <laughs> Holy shit. Because the, the amount of G-force, it was just G-force. like you immediately can't see. So when Holly and I rode this ride, uh, this is post the change where they toned it down a little bit. I fully grayed out, but I was still conscious. <laughs> Holly blacked out to the point where she remembers like waking up halfway through the ride where she was like, oh, shit, where am I? Oh, I'm on a ride. Like, that's how <laughs> intense it was. And Did you notice her like flopping around and everything? Yeah, she was. I remember kind of looking over and it wasn't like she looked like she was dead, but she definitely wasn't <laughs> oh, there so for a dead. second. So wow. naturally, we did ride it again after that. She wasn't afraid. Uh, and she didn't black out the second time, but she did fully lose vision, as as did I. <laughs> but yeah, I love wow. that kind of stuff. And I want to ride. I, I keep telling Brad, I want to make it out to Los Angeles and do mm-hmm. like a, a tour of theme parks, because particularly Six Flags Magic Mountain, they have a ride there that is, I believe, the only one in the U.S. called X or is it X2? Now, Brad, I, I don't yeah, remember. I, I'm not sure. I haven't been there in a while. But it's it's like a it, I think they describe it as a 4D roller coaster because there's there's the track that the that the ride rides on. But in the track, it controls how your seats are. Mm. Oh, so it will okay. it's designed that you'll be sitting and then it will take a straight drop down and it will rotate your seats. So you're facing downward <laughs> during is, the drop. Oh, yeah, that's insane. Yeah. So that sounds awesome. I really want to go and uh, check out those rides there. Dude, it's so disappointing. When we were in Japan. We decided Universal was going to be our only theme park. But mm-hmm. there's um, Fuji Q Highlands is the the park in Japan that has some of the like best in the world. And so next time we go to Japan, I'm going to have to go there, too. But I could talk about roller coasters and theme parks all day. So I will <laughs> I'll conclude here. But Maddie, I don't know where you're at on this. I, oh, I kind of let me guess. <laughs> let's guess. Yeah, let's you're hear, not let's... a you're not into roller coasters. You know me well, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> I, I had me. a feeling you wouldn't be I into it. Know. Yeah, I, I got that bitch energy. Yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dude, I, 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 I love hearing from people like Dustin because it's like you have so much bigger balls than me. Like just the idea of like, yeah, I went on a thing. I fucking blacked out. I'm like, nah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> you know, it's funny because like Laley and I went to Universal a few years ago and I I would imagine this is like if you had a one to ten meter, this might be a two. For me, it was probably like an eight, though. It was the uh, Rise of the Mummy ride in there. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was it was defined as like a like an interactive kind of ride where I was like, oh, you know, you get to kind of ride through the movie with like you did it like Harry Potter world. Like there were certain rides that were just more experience based rides. Right. So I'll, me innocently, I get online and we're about to get on. I look to my left. And so there's two tracks, I guess. And I'm looking as one track's about to take off. And when they take off, they just bolt like really fast. Mm-hmm. And I just look at Laylee like, what are you what are we doing right now like this is i was like this is not what i signed up for but it's was, it was too late right i had to just stomach it so i get on we take off you're going really fast I, i'm gonna try my best to paint this picture for the audience because i think they'll get a real kick out of me just losing my shit on this ride so we're flying along and i'm at first i'm in the the, the coping phase of like I can handle this. Like, this is, this is nothing I've been through worse. Like I'm not, you know, they, I'm starting to to rationalize. I'm like, they, they treat these tracks every day. There hasn't been, you know, any reports of any, you know, lack of safety here. Like I'm going to be fine. Right. Like it was just, just rationalizing. Right. So ride along going pretty fast, but it's doable. And then we go up this hill. I'm like, oh man, it's going to be a big drop. And they subvert my expectations. Wonderfully. So, because then They just drop you back down backwards and you go probably double the speed you were going up backwards. So now you're like going against the seat backwards. (laughs) At this point, I am yelling every expletive under the sun (laughs) to the point where I can't even breathe. (laughs) And I black out and the ride's over. And I'm like, it's like never again. (laughs) It's like never fucking again. (laughs) 
Lately, I did not want to be a fun killer. She went on like the Incredible Hulk ride by herself and stuff. And I felt bad. I'm like, am I a horrible partner? Like, I feel like I'm not being a man of the relationship here by like going going to my beloved side and, and helping her on the the to the roller coaster and, and braving these loop the loops. So I was like, I can't fucking do that, man. Um, but yeah, as a kid, whenever there was, you know, like our school would have, I don't know if you guys had a similar thing, but our school would have these days where like, you know, we're going to Six Flags or something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was to me a you know, market on the calendar. That's a day I get to stay home and play video games. That was always the plan, <laughs> seriously. So I just never showed up to those. I just stayed home and played games because, you know, I, I, I think of uh, if I liked anything, it was water parks. Went to Lake Compounds Ooh, <clears throat> when I was a kid. Yeah. I really liked that one. That was good. That was good. Like a, a good balance of thrills, but, you know, really fun focused. Like it was it was perfect for someone like me. I had so mm. much fun there. Um, and that's like my one moment I hang on to is like, all right, you know, these things can be pretty good. You just got to get mm-hmm. the right ones. Uh, they had this one uh, ride that was, was it like the mammoth something? Anyway, they you sit in a tube and you go down a pitch black tunnel oh. for like a minute or two minutes straight. And it's just you're just flying. It's actually like sit, complete sensory deprivation now that I think about it. Uh, and then you just come out and you just fly off like a lip into a pool. It's it's crazy. But uh, that park was a good time. And that's like the one good moment I, I really hang on to. But otherwise, when it comes to like thrill rides, amusement parks, like I, I think part of it's a natural fear for sure. I think the other part of it is like any time when I where I lived growing up, like they build a splashdown. You see like a year later, like kid flies off a splashdown ride and falls to his death i'm like why the fuck do i want to take that chance like i already take a chance getting into my car and just driving to the grocery store just i risk getting hit like why the hell am i gonna seek this out Mm -hmm. actively and just like i'm just reading these reports constantly and i know it's like a a small percentile but what if i'm that percentile so i just decide Mm -hmm. not to take the chance and that's where i stand on amusement park rides i figured it'd be good to put me in the middle here as kind of the the pin in the balloon you got the enthusiast <laughs> dustin you got the naysayer and maddie hopefully brad and Dag can can balance us out a little bit more so i'm mm. not a complete vibe slayer uh <laughs> maddie i have a question for you sure have you ever been to galaxy's edge at either disney no World i really want to go though dude okay so maddie let me tell you this you're gonna flip out it's like how dustin was describing like the harry potter stuff they try to have like lore around it maddie and like very nice. yeah star that's, wars yeah, like my spawn speed. everywhere writing like that they try to like hide some yeah. stuff you can get blue milk or green milk they got the cantina bar oh, with yeah. actual alcohol but the <laughs> rides maddie okay the rides are not like roller coasters dude mm. one of the rides is you sit in the millennium falcon cockpit and everyone has like a different role someone's flying a ship someone's manning guns and stuff like that managing shields that's awesome the other one rise of resistance is the coolest like production line you ever go through you get like you're with the rebels dude you go through a bunch of stuff you get caught by the imperials they put you in like a prison cell you get busted out by some rebels and stuff like that and you go on like a little crazy track thing it's not a roller coaster maddie so i think you would have a really good time if you went on those yeah as amazing. a big star wars fan you're gonna freak out at some of the stores that's like one of my goals in the next year or so i really want to go to galaxy's edge like i've been saying it for years i was supposed to go it was it was actually the week that i uh dustin I'll remember this when i like hurt my back so bad i missed defining duke because i could barely sit um i was supposed to go to the galaxy's edge that week and uh i, I so it's like one of those things where i'm like man i really want to go check it out. Like he's a huge star Wars fan. I hear nothing but amazing stuff. Like, even though I already have like a lightsaber, for example, like I want to put one there. Like, yeah, I'm, I think I'm definitely an experience driven guy, which is why something like galaxy's edge works for me. I, even though I'm not a big Harry Potter fan, like uh, Harry Potter world was awesome. Like just the focus on the experience there. And like the, yeah, like I, I guess I looked at it through the lens of, of my fiance because she just loves Harry Potter. So it was oh, yeah. like, you know, mm-hmm. really cool to see her in like Diagon Alley. She's like, oh my God, it's just like the movies and like get her own wand and stuff. It was really cool. So yeah, to, to have that with Star Wars, I'm I'm very excited about that. So that's that's all, like I'm not gonna ignore that sort of experience. But when it comes to just like let's go to Six Flags. Like, yeah, right. sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll stay home for that one. Maddie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, Maddie, that you so the the mummy ride that's like a dark ride uh yeah and i 
outside of that Batman ride I mentioned, the most fearful I feel on rides is during dark rides. Mm. Um, and I think but it has to space mountain dust, right? Space. That's mountain, true. So, so that was, was your maiden voyage. That was my maiden voyage. Yeah. And I, it's funny. I remember parts of it, but not super clearly since it mm. was, you know, so long ago for long me, but ago, yeah. now some of the rides I've ridden, there's a dark ride at King's dominion that I rode. That's just like a, a straight up roller coaster, but it's in the dark in a building. And I wow. remember there's like a slow moving part where you're kind of angled to the side and I was like, I, I hate this. I, and I don't know what it is because it's less intense of a ride. But the fact I can't see where I'm going or mm. what's around me made it way, way worse. So, yeah, because me, the breaking point was going backwards on that ride because I have no uh, idea where I'm going. I'm just going yeah. at top speed backwards. Yeah. So those dark rides, I mean, they're cool. Like the there's a dark ride. Well, it's kind of a dark ride at for harry potter uh, i can't remember what it's called but it takes you through and you're on like these seats that it's oh, not right. really a roller coaster but they put you into almost like a giant vr where it feels mm-hmm. like you're flying over hogwarts and stuff like that but that also oh, it's like the avatar bit. ride then okay yeah, yeah. What do you guys VR think of um i don't like these but there was one i did for the simpsons in universal where they put you in a car literally just in a single room and they you watch a screen and they just have this car that can just tilt like left right down sure. backwards and they kind of just simulate what's happening in in synchronization with the what's on screen and it creates yeah. this kind of experience ride feel but you're really just like rocking around in a room I don't yeah. know if you guys have ever tried those before, but I, I never I didn't enjoy those much either. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of those kinds of rides as much. Some are cool, like Star Tours, obviously. Star Tours, Class, Star Tours. Yeah, Classic right. Man. It's like the ones that started. But yeah, Universal, they went a little too ham on all that kind of stuff. So I prefer like actual rides where you're really moving through an environment right. way more. Rather than the illusion of movement. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Yeah, Dust, I heard. That X roller coaster, they had to change the name to Twitter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Brad, I yes. want to tell you a heartbreaking story about Galaxy's Edge. Um, been to, I guess the last time I was with the family in Disney World in Orlando mm-hmm. was 2020. And Galaxy's Edge there was open for like a year already. So I was really looking forward, huge Star Wars fan dating back to the 70s. So I was really looking forward to it. But I'm with three people that couldn't be more apathetic about Star Wars. And it was the most joyless experience because it was, (laughs) we were there in the summer. It was like 96 degrees. They were miserable. And even Helene, like she couldn't just keep it together for 45 minutes so I could just enjoy it. Now, I think it was before those two rides that you mentioned. So it was basically relegated to walking around, interacting with the stormtroopers. A couple of shops were open. You could get the blue milk. Mm-hmm. Take a picture with us with an X wing, whatever it was. So it was still a, a more minimal experience, but it was like my. It was like you got like how much sacrifice do I make for this family? Can you just pretend to have fun for like an hour so I can yeah. freaking enjoy this? <laughs> Terrible. It was. Yeah, it was like sucks. I remember walking out of there being so angry. Like I paid thousands of dollars for this vacation. You couldn't humor me, you know, type of thing. It was so funny. That's messed up, but, man. Damn. It was craziness. It was absolute craziness. Yeah, could throw you a bone. <laughs> yes, like that's the story of my life. Honestly, you know, so it's it, it's it's on uh, it's on brand yeah. for the Moriarty family. But uh, the ships are so cool. There, you're talking about oh, like, I the see. life size like X wing, and they have Kylo Ren ship. Man, they're so rad. That like oh, humans, that's right. I man, remember you seeing love that. All that stuff. Yeah, I'm, and Kylo I'm Ren like, was you guys walking around excited just talking about it. Yeah, <laughs> that was like the only the only hook I could get into Helene was maybe that's Adam Driver under there. Yeah, you know what I mean. Then it like caused a minimal amount of uh, excitement. It was like so, you know, like maybe it's him, you know, type of thing. Like it was, it was terrible. I had to resort to all kinds of crazy, desperate tactics. <laughs> but it's so crazy. Like it's a, this is going to be. I'm going to get my pipe for Dagan mm. screaming, old man Dagan screaming at clouds again. But when I grew up, it was really different than even when Brad was growing up, mm-hmm. for instance, because there was a real. I talk about this a lot on the shows, but there really was a delineated thing when I was like an adolescent that I'm still so bitter about where there was like this cutoff in sixth grade where it was like, all right, time to put the toys away. Don't admit you watch cartoons. 
try, you know, it's time to trade all the kids stuff in for girls and sports. Like that was a six. I remember the summer going into sixth grade, just realizing that. And it was such a bummer, but the one bright spot that you were allowed to enjoy little kid things with amusement parks. That was like the one thing was like, it's okay to still act like a kid with that kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. maybe that was a big reason I went in for like the really nice theme parks or even like the shitty pop-up carnivals that roll into your town in the summertime, you know, with the indifferent, possibly drunk ride operators (laughs) and the rusty sort of rickety equipment and everything like that. I loved all that kind of stuff growing up. And you know what? The cr- I'll tell you this, Brad. I don't. I lived in LA for a little while. I went to Disneyland once or twice when I was living out there. But when I went, we started taking the kids to Disney in the 20 teens. And I think we went like three times. The one thing that struck me about the Magic Kingdom in particular, walking into Main Street, was like, Every adult had to stop at the Starbucks as you're entering yeah. the park. Oh, yeah. It was like even Starbucks managed to infiltrate even the Magic Kingdom. Yep. And it became all about like, and, and Helene was no different. It was like every day going into, let's say we spent five days of the 10 days at the Magic Kingdom was like every day, the first, you know, the first order of business was going to Starbucks, waiting in a huge line and getting a latte. It was <laughs> like, Really? Even even here, we can't escape can't this. Escape so that was it, is Disneyland the same with that? There's they a Starbucks, got a Starbucks there. Yeah, going in on so Main Street. Crazy. Yeah, there's one right there. It's so crazy to me. Yeah, they made me laugh. I was like, this is so we can't even break the habit. I know we're in the greatest. The greatest <laughs> place you sound like me lately. She she had like she's kicked her coffee addiction, but like, bro, there was just a time where like, and, and no matter what we had to do, we had to find a Starbucks. I'm just like, please stop. <laughs> enough <laughs> i was like we're on vacation we just need to break from this for a little bit of time. it's an addiction man yeah. it is <laughs> yeah my wife and my daughter who will be 17 she's the same you know what i mean they have to have it daily and even on vacation like like it's like god forbid we go back to like the caribbean where there's no starbucks are you guys gonna be able to make it i'm not even sure <laughs> to be honest with you you know but that was the um the thing for me i will say that this struck a chord with something that Maddie said with his gal and the roller coasters is I've, I've always loved the roller coasters Mm -hmm. and I'm not even sure I enjoy it as much as I see it as a challenge. Like there's something, there's some weird, and maybe this is the skateboarder in me. I don't know. There's, it's not an evil Knievel thing, but it's, there's some thrill seeking part of my personality where it's like, if the challenge is in front of me, I have to do it. Now, if I w- even in the prime of my skating, if there was a set of 30 stairs, I wasn't going to kickflip it. I'm not, <laughs> not stupid. But so it's in reason. But if there's something, if there's a roller coaster there, I feel like I have to do it. Or it's like that Richie Cunningham chicken thing. It's like, and no one even has to be saying that to me. I just, there's something that I take on where it's like, I have to do it. Mm-hmm. But the thing about roller coasters in particular is that it's a communal experience. And you're always going on a roller coaster with other people, but I feel like you could only really enjoy it if you're with somebody that you know, like whether it's a spouse or significant other or friend or one of the kids in my case, like you have to, it's a team experience. If I was going on the roller coaster alone, it wouldn't be as fun, even though you're not alone, you're with a bunch of strangers, but you got to be enjoying it arm in arm with somebody. And I'll tell you why. This is another debacle in my life. My kids, both of them started out really gung-ho about rides. Soon as they were tall enough to get on the roller coaster, they were like, let's do it. To the point where, especially Helene would be like, I don't know. And I'm, you know, my whole thing was like, they're tall enough. Let's go, you know. Slowly, both of them, same trajectory, complete cowards. 13 and seven, almost 17, won't go on a ride anymore. Mm -hmm. And Helene really can't. I think now in her 40s, she just... She gets dizzy. Mm-hmm. It's that motion thing. She may black out. She may get, you know, it's that whole thing of get, getting disoriented, I guess. So whenever we go to an amusement park, Dust, talking about Hershey Park, last time I was there, I couldn't go on anything because no one was going to do it with me. And I was like, this isn't going to be fun. You guys are going to be waiting in the, hot, in the 95 degree heat for me to wait on this line so I could go on a roller coaster and do it by myself. Kids want to go off and play. 
carnival games that are pay to play. It's like, I just paid a hundred dollars a person to get in here. <laughs> you know, it's like, nobody wants to do anything. So yeah, me and the, and the, and the family and the amusement park thing, it's not, yeah, it's not it doesn't sound good. like it's clicking right now. <laughs> yeah. It's not going well. It sounds man. like you're getting the shit end of the deal there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to come out here. I'll go. Well, maybe gaming. that I was thinking about that when you guys were talking earlier, maybe that's incentive to have our West coast LSM fan show thing up by Brad, you know, in the Anaheim, Orange County area, whatever, yeah, like really that's easy. incentive not to go to San Fran, not to go to San Diego, just go into the LA, you know, SoCal area and do it there. I think that, I mean, we could t- try to twist Colin's arm a little mm. bit, right? I yeah. mean, that'll be fun. I don't think Colin, re- well, I'm trying to remember, we've talked about roller coasters at some point, but. I tried to get him to go to the park near his house when I was there. I tried to get him and Micah to go and he used to love, invite. dude, he spent, he's told you, right? He spent at least two back-to-back summers Oh, going like, yeah, like Fair amusement point. park jumping all up and down the East coast and maybe even into the Midwest a little bit with his friend and his friend's parents. Yeah. They would just go to Knott's Berry to, you know, whatever great adventure was there and this and that they would just go from place to place because i remember he was in pennsylvania a lot because we have a lot here we have donny park we have hershey um great adventures nearby and um six flags great adventures nearby in jersey there's a ton sesame place (laughs) if you like the sesame street (laughs) themed water rides baby that's like a half hour from my house um and that's a good that's a good point that maddie brought up too the water slides and the water parks is fun Mm-hmm. But when I started to get really claustrophobic, mm. I could only go in the open ones. I can't go in the tube ones. Yeah. Same. Mm. No, MRIs are in that for me. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Oh, is that? So, Maddie, you've gone through an MRI, a closed MRI? Yep. Oh, yeah. I that's tr- I tried, I should say. Nightmare. I actually found a solution because I couldn't really like withstand it. Like that, It was weird. Like I've never been... I never had that feeling before, but yeah, Mm -hmm. I I had to find this new type of MRI called like a stand up MRI where you just kind of like sit in a seat. It gives you the same results, but it's like an open facing tube and they just like put a cage over the area. Like for me, it was my brain. I was getting an MRI of, so it was even worse. They just stick your head in the tunnel. So you even like, yeah, you don't even get like a little bit of fresh air. So yeah, that was great. And I got to watch two episodes of SVU, but like that whole experience leading into that, I discovered I had some level of claustrophobia of some kind. And so, yeah, stuff that was like tubes and closed areas, uh, you know, like I can have like the door shut behind me, like that type of shit, like doesn't bug me. Like my grandma was really bad. Like she couldn't shut her front door at night, like that type of claustrophobia. Mm. Um, Yeah, I didn't have that, but I don't have that. I should say, but uh, yeah, man, like nowadays, if I were to like get on a ride, it would have to be like open facing for sure. Like the Dustin mentioned, like the dark ones and stuff like I would have to be out in the open. Like I, I think one I could try, I wish I knew the name of it, but like Harry Potter world has this one outdoor roller coaster that kind of goes and what looks like an oval shape. Like it goes up and down. It's outdoor. It's a the Hagrid motorbike yes. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They didn't have cool. that one in Japan. But yeah. I think that, yeah. I think that one, I love how you're so well versed that you knew what I was talking about. Yeah. That's <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah. I haven't ridden it, but like a professor. I know about it. <laughs> it. That one looks tolerable. Like it's all about the gut for me. You know, can I, yeah. You know, feel like I, will, I can tolerate that. Yeah. One, one thing that I was just thinking is that now, so I, I was mentioning being into theme parks and roller coasters as a kid and my parents like roller coasters, but you know, very Western PA. Uh, and I don't fault them for this. You know, I was talking about growing up, not having a lot of money, but very uh, budget friendly trips mm-hmm. to these. And now mm-hmm. as an adult and having some <laughs> disposable income, dude, when I went to Hershey park, last we were only there for like not even a full day so me and this was actually a a listener that i became friends with that was there we went together we were like dude we're gonna get the fast pass because we gotta we're paying to get get in and we're gonna be there and we want to ride everything this is the only way we're gonna do it go all in that little taste though of the fast pass life dude (laughs) oh (laughs) next time i go to cedar point i i think i'm gonna have to do it because some of these rides at Cedar Point, depending on the day, it's like two plus hours to wait in line it's in the hot it. sun. Right. And uh, it's brutal. So You'll I think I'm going to have to do that. Um, surprisingly, like, Cedar Point's pretty 
affordable overall. Like when Holly and I went, we stayed at the hotel, not quite in the park, but basically right outside. Mm. You get like drink pass, you know, you get early Whoa. access. Okay. And I was like, Man, this is uh, it's like all inclusive. Yeah. It's so nice. It's pretty, you know? pretty solid. But I've been hearing uh, I saw a YouTube video. I didn't watch it. I think Holly did. That was about that, like Disneyland and Disney World is restrictively unaffordable now. Like it's mm. the prices have gotten so astronomical. Isn't it like I bet it's a lot worse. Yeah, I wonder, like, how much is it? Let's see, day pass to Disney yeah, World. Let's, let's see. In 2020, I want to say it was 125 a person. Wow. 125. Okay. I wait. bet it's more than that now. Man, that was making this tough ago. for me to actually figure out how much it is. I know Cedar Point is like 60 or 70, maybe. That's not bad. To get in. But, okay, so. Well, when you think about. Yeah, Disney uh, one, Disney World is a hundred and nine a day. Oh, all right, so it wasn't that high when I maybe it was ninety when I was there. Yeah, which sounded reasonable because some of the shittier, not shitty, but like we have an amusement park out here in Lancaster and like Amish country called Dutch Wonderland. Dude, that's not terrible. I, not we terrible. always drive You've past been? that. Pat, when oh, we go you gotta know. Games. It's good. And I, there's a couple of good things there. I it the rides from driving by look kind of cool, but I was like, what the fuck is Dutch Wonderland. Is this Not like the an Amish, Might, well, Amish theme park? Rebrand. Like, what are we, what are we doing here? Uh, but <laughs> they should rebrand Dutch Wonderland for sure. Yeah. It's a, it's not the best name, but I think it's like, I think it was like 90 bucks. And I was like, really? Do you know how much Disney is? You guys are almost there. It's like, you're, it's like you're comparing apples to oranges. Maddie, I did want to ask you one question. Please. As a fellow claustrophobic, this is something new to me as my claustrophobia just gets worse and worse as I age. But I have a thing, like again, with roller coasters, Maddie said a cool thing before where it's like you're you're computing the odds in your head, but it's like there's a 99.999% chance nothing's going to go wrong. I don't mind the speed. I don't mind the heights. I don't mind the loops. I don't even mind if a, like it's like an old rickety wooden roller coaster. I'll take a chance. I see. I think if I see wood, nope. <laughs> All right. So that's so that's a bar. Yeah. You can't go pit. All right. Yeah. But I can't get. I don't. I don't like being strapped in. That's my thing. It's mm. almost a claustrophobia thing of like I don't like that harness and the immobility. Yeah. Which never bothered me until maybe I got into my thirties. Then all of a sudden it was like, no, I feel like. I don't like to feel inhibited, you know, like, yeah. like I can't, like, like your what brain if this thing makes, doesn't come up? Like it's, just, it's unreasonable, but it's claustrophobia. Yeah. Like your brain makes you want, like you, you feel like the need to be able to respond to a moment that like you, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And right. Like, but it's like, well, I'm on a roller coaster. Like I would want to be fastened. Right. So that's true. You. That's the trade off. Right. You know, and I have to act like that was a thing too. I remember when the kids were still little and as these fears were developing, it's like, you got to pretend. You just kind of, kind of take it on the chin because you don't want to show them that you're afraid of these crazy things or that you're being stopped from having fun because you have these unreasonable fears or whatever. But it's so funny. My kids are both the same now. Like they both, they're both super claustrophobic. It's like, oh my God, what did I do to these kids? <laughs> it's like, oh damn jeans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe it's a jeans thing. Maddie, I, I put a link in the chat. I'll, I'll put it in the video so people can see it. This is oh, your yeah. worst nightmare. Uh, this happened, yeah, eight months ago. Uh, there was a crack in a roller coaster support, and oh. someone filmed it. You can just see as the roller oh, coaster goes around no. the loop, it just oh, shifts just to moves. the right. Come on, no, oh, that is a Dustin, nightmare. You're not helping me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, my god, stuff like Dude. that happened. Everyone's yeah. fine, you know. They they fixed it. It's all good. But it's like seeing something wrong with the plane from the from the window. It's like, oh shit, the wings falling off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are we gonna do? <laughs> that is, is truly. I feel like I've 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 cemented any fear of roller coasters now in Maddie from this one clip. <laughs> I feel fully justified that did now. It. Hey, Maddie, Disneyland, no loops, dude. You're yeah. good to go. Yeah, no loops. Like, that's a good point. No loops at Disneyland. Wow, bunch of California bitches. Adventure. There's a loop. Yeah, I mean, oh. okay. There's a loop at California Adventure, but no, not Disneyland. I want to ride that uh the Toy Story ride. It sucks. Uh, no, you know. It sucks. I heard it was yeah. cool. It's fast. Oh, wait, which Toy it's Story ride fast. are you talking about? Uh, I think it's Toy Story Mania. It's the roller coaster, yeah, it's, right? No, you shoot. Uh, 
at California Adventure. Oh wait, they changed the name of it. Yeah, it used to be a different name. Okay. It's yeah, it is the roller coaster with the loop. It used to be called like California Scream, and I forgot they changed it. Oh, they like okay. re there's like a boardwalk area in California Adventure, and they rebranded that to like all Toy Story or Pixar, I think. It's okay. It's cool. Yeah. Have you seen this uh this Tron ride? Uh, yeah. I guess this this isn't at land, this is at world. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And I think Man. it's from Shanghai originally. Tron is so I'm, cool, dude. Yeah, it's cool. uh, coming back. Dude, I used, yeah, to, I used to just like to... Tron because of Kingdom Hearts too, because like I thought his world was so boring. So just by principle, <laughs> like I just I was like, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it really? How'd they mess that up? I don't think they messed it up. I, no, I, I replayed really Kingdom Hearts too, like a, a like over a year or so ago, and I was like, this isn't it that bad. It's just like the the bike mini game they make you do. I'm like, oh, oh I see. But Tron's great in combat. Mm hmm. All right, I'm very satisfied with that. You're topic. satisfied? Now, yeah. you were right, Brad, though. They do have that other Toy Story thing where you sit in the car and you shoot the virtual. Yeah, you shoot it like on screen, yeah. Right, it's, and you, you rally, tally up your score or It's whatever. not worth sitting in line for, I'd say. If it's like Big a 10-minute line, 20 minutes, sure. Then it's worth it, Or if yeah. you got like, probably, I bet like younger kids would have a really good time on it. Yeah, otherwise. yeah that's a good yeah. point. Dude, that's always a tough, tough thing at, at Cedar Point. I mentioned the dragster. I think Dragster is, it was like under 30 seconds. It might have been in the 20s. And Damn. you wait in line for, for two hours. To, That's the to, worst. To go on this ride for 30 seconds. But That's the worst. it was the craziest 30 seconds of your entire life. So it was worth it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. So you're a real enthusiast, Dust. That's how you know you're true blue. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're willing to do the wait for that short payoff, but the payoff is still enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brad, I know this is your topic, but I want to, I want to ask everybody a, a question yeah. before we leave. What is your favorite overall ride? Mm -hmm. I'll give you guys a sec to think because mine. Give me a moment. Is, I got to really go through them all. I know Matt, Maddie's going <laughs> to you have to really think about this, but my favorite <laughs> ride that I've ever been on is steel vengeance at well it's between steel vengeance and maverick at cedar point but steel vengeance is that's a rmc roller coaster so rocky mountain construction and their deal is that they take old or older wooden roller coasters and convert them and give them steel track so and they have like a very particular their rides have the most airtime of any roller coasters so that's like the feeling of of floating off of your seat. And if you've never seen Steel Vengeance, go look up a like a POV track on on mm. YouTube. It is insane. You're twisting all over the place. I mean, the, the first drop is straight down mm -hmm. and it is unsettling. Maddie mentioned wooden uh, <laughs> wooden rides. And so when you see a wooden ride, you think of more traditional roller coaster. That's a wooden coaster. But this is not that. Um, mm. These like conversion ones, they're crazy. So if you ever cool. have a chance to ride an RMC or even go to Cedar Point, Steel Vengeance, it'll uh, blow your mind. But Brad, yeah, favorite ride. Uh, so here's my f what I look for in rides. Most of all is atmosphere is the mm. most important thing to me. So my my favorite ride, I guess, is the Haunted Mansion from Disneyland. Not a oh. roller coaster. Nothing like that. You're just going through real slow, but it's all about painting, setting the mood, really bringing you into this ride, the lore behind it, going through the mansion. Of course, the queue going through, you go in the elevator room, the narrator talking about everything. You're going down slowly. You see the paintings going down with you. Then the lights go off, flashes the body hanging at the top. And you slowly start making your way, walking through the mansion. You get in the little buggies and you go through it. It's just a classic ride, in my opinion, and with such great atmosphere and storytelling, I just adore it. But if it's not a thrill seeker ride at all, mm. yeah, dude, that uh, sometimes, dude, the queue on in theme parks, the yeah, the, the queue really line good. for the Mario Kart ride at Nintendo Land is better than the actual ride. I believe it because uh, you're going through Bowser's castle, dude. Yeah, I believe <laughs> you've got the it. giant Bowser statue. You see, like they've got Koopas in there. They're working on stuff. It is mm -hmm. so cool, amazing, dude. Indiana Jones has good line too. If you guys have ever been on that, it's oh, like, no, I've never been. really long line. You're like going through like a temple and like India and stuff like that. And they've got like 
prop set up like spike traps as you're walking through it and all that stuff and videos playing of like archaeologists going through it it's so good that sounds so cool yeah it's so cool it's like in a jungle area they like made it all a jungle around there it's like right next to the jungle crew so it's awesome yeah maddie do you have i mean have the, surely there's been a ride surely maddie that you've enjoyed even, even if it's basic it doesn't need to be crazy all right, let's see here. Let's, do <laughs> let's dig in. Lake Compounds rides. This is your one chance. All right, let's see here. Um, man, there's nothing. I mean, you this can't been, just say this fuck is, it. This has been no since rides. sixth grade, might I add. So I imagine Lake Compounds has changed dramatically since my last tour of the. They still have this wooden roller coaster and they're promoting it as classic coaster modern thrill see like are you fucking insane like that's that's crazy to me man um all right let's see you know i'm a big fan of the lazy river is that a good answer yeah love a good lazy yeah, river. yeah that's a great river. answer love a good, love a good lazy river i love your honesty yeah that is uh I'm, everyone knows my vibe i'm very about chill relaxation full immersion anything rip roaring life endangering you will not catch me near <laughs> yeah dude i am the, i am the boring one <laughs> everyone's afraid of some some something in rides i'm convinced i'll i'm, I'm sorry i have, I have another thing something. to share the scariest ride i've ever been on is the wind seeker at yeah, cedar let's, point let's see this i sent you guys a little video all it yeah, is no. just sit in this thing it goes yeah. in a circle but it goes insanely high oh yeah and oh, yeah. you can no see thanks. the lap bar on it. it's just a lap bar you're not yeah harnessed yeah. in holly and i got on this thing because we're like oh it's it's just a little you just go in circles nice sit and feel the feel the breeze no halfway up we looked at each other and simultaneously like uh i hate this i want to get off this as soon as possible because Ooh, i want bro, to my hands are sweating just looking at this man. that's an insane level of trust to give to the general population as well. That somebody's not going to panic. Somebody's not just going to be like, I'm going to jump off this thing. Like, dude. And it's not, it's nowhere near the a highest. La a lap ride. bar is crazy, bro. That's nuts. Yeah. yeah. I would have to, though. I'm I would so have thin to that I might slide right through that and just fall off to my death. That's it. Yeah. Dude, it's, that's crazy. It's like I said, it's not the highest ride, but because you are stationary with this little lap bar. Yeah. It's, it's horrifying. But, uh, <laughs> So yeah, dig. Yeah, favorite. Ride. I mean, we talked about Space Mountain. That was always a favorite. Oh, of mine. so good. All it's so good. It's timeless. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really changed as far as I know since the first time I went on in like 1980. Oh, they do like theme stuff for it. They did like a Star oh, Wars one know. one time. Really? Themed around Star Wars, yeah, for a little bit. It's always like limited though. That's a great idea though. Yeah. Just to inject a little modern flavor into it. That, although, as a kid, it didn't bother me. I could just ride it over and over again. I remember yeah. late night, like before the park closed and there was no queue. But now, I do get disoriented and dizzy. And I remember the first time, Helene never went to, I don't know how, because she was such a princess, so spoiled growing up. But her parents just were against Disney World. And they never went. So the first time she ever went was like 2016 when we took the kids and I was hyping up Space Mountain, hyping up Space Mountain. And she went on it with my daughter, who was, you know, much younger then. And they both got off it like, we will never ride that again. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, is this whole family adopted? I don't know what's happening. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's like they hated it. And I, but it's still to this day, my fa one of my favorites. And then we had, I don't know if you guys ever experienced this. Maybe Matt, there, there was a, you know, great adventure, Six Flags Great Adventure in Jersey. It's not that far from me. There was, I guess, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a roller coaster called the Great American Scream Machine. Mm. I don't even know if it's still there, to be honest with you. Back then, they bragged that it was one of the highest, however many stories it was, high. And I remember that being <laughs> thrilling when I was a kid. Although I'm sure there's been much more badass roller coasters since then. That was the one I grew up with in my adolescence that was like, that was the one you got to brag about when you got home to your friends. But you know what my favorite is, man? Honestly, Splash Mountain in Disney oh, World. Yeah. It's just a lazy river. Aren't they getting rid of it? Yes. They they were redoing it. Who knew a ride could be racist, right? Yeah, Song you know, of the they, South. The ride said well. some horrible shit online. They got to get rid of it. 
<laughs> they had to totally retheme. It was closed in 2020 when we were there. It was completely under construction. I guess that's what it was about. It was like, we can't do the Br'er Rabbit right. thing anymore. It's like Song of the South did not age well. That's one staying in the Disney vault. But, you know, just a lazy river, a themed lazy river that just a glorified log flume at the end. You have the little thrilling bit at the end and this it's the build and mm-hmm. – it's fun, but the the kids could go on it when they were little, so they remember it fondly. So that was that was a favorite. Hell yeah, Swash so was great. It's a great one. Nice, cool. Hell yeah, roller coasters, theme parks. Let's do this topic again. Let's do a whole show. <laughs> we could probably do it again. And not, not cover the same ground twice. Yeah, you know. Nice job, you guys. Now look. Now, Brad, are you satisfied? Yes, I'm friend? very satisfied. Okay, good. Got to Perfect. learn a lot. All right, you guys, moving right along, moving at a nice pace here. Maddie, I was really intrigued by your topic, my friend. So uh, take the reins whenever you're ready. Yeah, so I um, I was trying to, to really think of something that would give us an opportunity to learn more about what we're missing in life. I wanted to talk about blind spots. I don't know if there's a more elegant way of labeling it, but... For me, like I'd say I'm pretty well versed in games, but whenever someone tries to talk a bit to me about like television or get into really the thick of things in politics, like I have very surface level knowledge in many areas. And these are kind of blind spots to me, some more excusable than others. Like maybe you can excuse TV and movies, politics. I always kind of just just due to the way the climate was, it felt very toxic and like no set of information was ever fairly represented on either side. So it's always been tough for me to like gauge where I should be standing. Um, But these are like blind spots in my life. And there are ways I'm working to kind of adjust to them specifically like TV and movies, trying to make more of like an active effort to just have, if you will, cultural enlightenment, you know, just see that side of the fence Uh, But it feels like anyone I talk to, they're always like, yeah, I'm reading this, I'm playing this, I'm watching that. And I'm like, I never really, maybe I just was like a video game elitist, but I never really like grew up like that. Uh, I always just enjoyed video games as like the superior entertainment medium because I think I always enjoyed something interactive. Um, And so I always, as I got older, I just struggled with movies and, and television. Like I just feel I'm just being so passive, not like I'm getting antsy, but um it never engaged me as much, but that's kind of my approach to it is like, maybe you guys are more well-versed in all of that. And maybe like a blind spot for you is like books or is it like exercise or like, like what's a part of life that maybe is escaping you that, you know, you'd enjoy, but you just haven't, you know, tried to go after, tried to, to not even master, but just enjoy, just dip your toe in the pool even. And like I said, for me, it's like I, I, you guys could each name a very, very popular movie and say, hey, Matt, Maddie, have you seen this? And it's like, the answer is probably no. Like, that's mm. God's honest truth. Like, there's so much I haven't seen, which is exciting, right? Because it's like, you know, I get to experience all this in like my adulthood where I think of like there are games that when I played them for the first time, like, man, what if I was like, I had so much more life experience behind me and then I had that, like, maybe it would have hit totally different. Um, So it's kind of exciting to approach it from there, but it was definitely born out of like just complete lack of experience, lack of care. It's a total blind spot for me. And so, um, Dag, I'm curious for you because you've seen Mm. more life than any of us here. Uh, You know, what do you have any blind spots at all, my friend? Yeah, this is a great topic, man. I mean, the first thing that came to mind when you when you emailed Maddie was for me, it used to be video games. I mean, Mm. there was I always loved video games as a kid, but somewhere into my adulthood, I stopped paying attention as much or was just very casual about video games. And it was, what was it again? About six years ago when I started podcasting with Kyle that kind of forced my hand into paying more attention to what's going on on the video game landscape. And it also made me lament that period where I wasn't paying attention because I loved them so much. Mm. So that was, it used to be video games, not so much anymore. But you know what, what you say, I really sympathize with that, Maddie, though, because, and I relate to it because it's a matter of bandwidth. Like how can each person just pay attention to everything, even the stuff that you want to pay attention to? It's like, I can only parse myself out to so many interests, right? So uh, I have two big ones. The first one is a blind spot that actually I think is pretty cool, although it wasn't intentional to make it a blind spot, and that's comic books. 
Mm, you know, like that's a good one. That's I one love going too, yeah. into the comic book shop once a month or maybe even once every two months and just perusing the shelves for anything that pops out, like anything that catches my eye, whether it's a cool character design or a reminder of a cartoonist that I like with a new book. And the downside is I think I've spent a lifetime feeling like the biggest poser going into comic book shops because I'm not a regular. Like I'm not a Wednesday warrior. I never have been. But I love them so much that I feel very defensive. I feel like almost like yelling out, like, don't judge me. I know I'm not here every week type of thing. Yeah. But it works for me. Like that cadence and that rhythm of going to the comic book shop every so often, I have a blast. Like if I could just get past the like don't judge me thing, which is which is a me problem. It's not a them problem. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's 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 the Dagster. That's on me. <laughs> but I love I love just going in and and having that blind spot because it's always a cool experience. I'm not paying attention. I listen to a couple of comic book related YouTube channels, but they tend to delve into older things anyway. So just going in and seeing what's contemporarily available is kind of is kind of neat, and uh, I enjoy it. So it works out for me that I keep that blind spot, and that's kind of become like a strategy for me. The other one, though, which is kind of sorry, and it really makes me feel like an old man, is music. And I just realized with music, I'm so dialed into the music that I love of the past, whether it's the stuff from the 70s that my parents grew up listening to that became like ingrained in me, like Zeppelin or Fleetwood Mac or Black Sabbath, or the stuff I grew up with in the 80s or hip hop of the 90s, all the way into the aughts, like the shoegaze music that I like, the alternative and the punk rock music that I like. I just have such a big back catalog of music that I like. I just don't, I, it's terrible to say, mm. but I just feel like I don't need anything else. So I don't pay attention to what's going on in modern music. I don't have a Spotify account. I don't use our Apple family music account. Like I just, I'm so content with everything I already know, but I, it's so limiting. Like I realize that's so wrongheaded because I could be discovering new bitching stuff, but I, I don't. I just I just put on YouTube and start listening to whatever's I like already. Do you think that kind of stems from like you you grew up during like the what many consider like the golden age of music, right? Mm. Like you think there's that cuz I feel like I share, I mean I I came much after that, but like I feel I have almost a shared ignorance of like I don't think music nowadays is nearly as good as it used to be. You know, there's just a stretch of time where it was developing so much there's great music nowadays don't get me wrong but i just looked at back then like you know 50s to 80s and it's just such a definitive time period of music and culture and uh just i don't think there's anything quite like it uh where nowadays it's all just riffing off of that so i'm curious do you think it stems from that like you have it really good you saw the best of it all and so like here you are now that's an awesome point I mean, it's so, it's, yeah, it's almost like, well, it's enough, or at least I'm content mm-hmm. or I'm happy. But it is, you, you realize you do limiting, you are limiting yourself because, and you know where this, she kind of saves me a little bit is having a 17 year old daughter who listens to new music and is very active. Like her music's very important to her. Mm. And she's really into discovering new music and going to concerts. And it could be anything from that we all know, like Taylor Swift to something a, a little more, um, sort of specialized or, you know, um, I guess, you know, she, she ranges, she doesn't, she doesn't get beholden to like this music is super popular or this stuff is much more, um, specialized or granular or has a much smaller band, fan base. She goes in for everything, but once in a while she'll be listening to something in the car or something. And I'm like, Oh, that's really good. And it's something from like this year or last mm-hmm. year. So it doesn't, you know what I mean? So it, it, it's a reminder to me that, oh man, you might be missing out on something that you really dig when you're too busy listening to your 90s hip hop, which I'll always love, but it's like make a little, you know, maybe you could develop some kind of strategy here where you just make an hour a day to like see what, see what you like and see what people compare that to and say, oh yeah, well this, they take a page out of this book. If you like De La Soul, you should listen to this guy. Yeah. Or if you like, you know, ween, you should listen to this or whatever it is. But yeah, the music is a really big blind spot for me. And it would probably just work. It's almost like, how do you find good 
contemporary fiction, right? You look on the New York Times bestseller list and you see, all right, at least this is what's popular right now. This is what the publishers are putting out and this is what people are flocking to in terms of trying out. So if there could be, if I had a Spotify account or something where I could be dialed into contemporary music, but I just listen to all my stuff on YouTube. My daughter always laughs at me. She's like, who does that? I'm like, dude, I'm 50 years old. You know what I mean? Like I, my habits are already ingrained. There's no, there's no breaking me. There's, that's it. It's done. Yeah, it, it's it's funny hearing you bring up music because that's one that I never really considered for myself, but it's completely true. Like I exclusively listen to game music at this point, which I guess is a niche and that's what music's all about. Like you find the genres or type mm. you like and just kind of explore that fully. But like I never connected well with like just traditional music often. Like, you know, it'd be kind of like I was a very much like a a there's got to be a term for it, but I just say I'm like a one song guy. So people, whenever they talk to me about music, they always go like, oh, this album, you know, what an album. And I'm like the one song guy who finds the thing I like. I listen to it for like a week or two straight. I get sick of it and that's it. Like it's just in this library. Like I have a, you know, Spotify has like the ability to just like a song and it adds it to a playlist of your mm. like songs. And literally all it is, is just a flurry of random songs throughout years that I just, Oh, I like this. Like, listen to it a ton, really enjoy it. Kind of serves its purpose for those couple of weeks. And I just dish to the side. I'd never listen to it again. And like, that's what I do. It's just a buildup of that for years and years. And so- That sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. You kind of play it out. You get enthusiastic, you play it out, you move on to the next thing. Yeah. And I don't know much about like particular albums. Like, they're like, oh, this is an iconic album. Mm. Like, I might know a song from it. <laughs> So it's ignorance at the end of the day for me, at least, but I- I feel the same way. I mean, Matt, you know what's what's sad about it from my perspective for myself is that this is probably arguably the best time to find even the most obscure music that you would be attracted to. It's true. There's so many channels for that, so many outlets, but I'm just like, I have that same, like my YouTube playlist is so sad because I don't think there's anything in it. As, you know, aside from the stuff that my daughter has introduced me to that I like, because I don't always like what she listens to, mm-hmm. you know, is that, wow, this stuff is all like at least 15 years old. And it's like, <laughs> you could be discovering the new shit too. And, and or, or at least kind of build up a, a trade-off where some's, some's new and some is old and stuff like that. And the, the other thing is my daughter refuses to acknowledge the stuff that she's listening to takes a huge page out of the book that we grew up with, the, you know, the music that Helene and I grew up listening to. Like she was listening to somebody, I forgot who it was, Boy Genius or something. Somebody, re, some band that's really talented. And I was like, wow, it sounds like a, a mashup between the Sundays, Bjork and Mazzy Star or something. And she, she would hear, she knows all of those things by association from growing up in the car with Helene and I, for instance. But she refuses to acknowledge the similarities. Mm. And I think she told me she thought Bjork was a man or something. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> like, don't you, you know what I mean? Like, it's just this generational divide where it's like, you know, that also might be a thing too. Like I'm being a curmudgeon about it, you know. What about you, Dustin? Hmm. Do you have any blind spots, sir? Yeah. So I, I guess there's a few ways that I can take this, but I'm glad someone brought up comic books because as someone who's so ingrained in nerd culture, I have never really cared about comic books nearly Mm. ever. And if I was, it was manga, which is not really what we're talking about here. Mm. So I, I don't think I've ever read like a Spider-Man comic book before. Mm. I think maybe I read, Oh yeah. I read the killing joke and that was the only Batman comic that I've read. And I think I I read Watchmen as well, but Mm. I uh, it's weird just because I do like manga and I go through phases where I'll read a lot and then I'll kind of put it down for a bit and then come back. But I have never been drawn to American or, you know, more Western style comics ever. And I don't really know why. Um, Obviously, like superheroes, we people are relentlessly tired of uh, (laughs) or tired of us relentlessly shitting on marvel movies and stuff like that on sacred (laughs) it's such an lsm thing uh, yeah but i uh you know and i enjoyed a lot of marvel movies and dude like 
um infinity war was amazing and end game like yeah. i watched all of those movies up to that and i loved it so it's not that i don't like superheroes i just i don't know my, my parents were never into that and there was really no one close to me so i didn't really even have like an entry point um so that's one the other big big one that leaves me feeling the most uh isolated or or left out but not in a way that i i want to be part of it is sports Mm -hmm. it, i uh, mm -hmm. i don't know there i went through a short phase in sixth grade because my two really good friends were really into football so i kind of just got into it in a way of hanging out with them and I don't, so that was in sixth grade when i was in elementary school and by seventh grade when i had a, a larger pool of friends not that these guys were bad dudes but we kind of grew apart and i was like okay well that that part of my life is is done and i've been to you know pirates games and i've been to a steelers game and stuff like that so it's not like i'm totally outside of it but i don't know how many years it's been that I, since i've watched the super bowl even at all it's just like this past year holly and i was like well if someone had a party and invited me i would go but we were just at home watching one piece I think Brad, were, were we playing Hell Divers or was I playing Hell Divers we with somebody? We were that night too. Yeah. Yeah, we were. So it's just not something I have no a younger, uh, stupider, more stupid Dustin would have been a dickhead about it. He's like, oh, sports, that's lame. You guys want to watch a bunch of men roll around in tights with each other, you know, just trying to <laughs> just be a dickhead, you know. And I now I just I'm like, cool, I'm glad people are into it. I I love the sense of sports, the the companionship of rooting for the same team. I think that that's cool. the community aspect. Sure. I've always thought has been cool. And uh, it's like, even though I've never been into baseball, I always thought that the Pirates, the fact that they were this not very good team for many, many years. I know they yeah. I think in the 70s, they were a lot better. But yeah, yeah. I've always thought it was cool that Pitt in Pittsburgh, it's like, yeah, that's our team. We we love them. We support them. They're not very good, but people are going to Pirates games and and love it. And I always thought that that was a really neat aspect of it. And You're you back in your city. I mean, Dustin, you know what's hard about this? I can relate because yeah. I didn't get into sports till very late in my 20s. And then it was really getting from being a little kid. And then it was really becoming solely a, a Yankees fan. But it's hard in a great sports town like Pittsburgh. You got the Penguins. You got the Pirates. You got the Steelers because it's all around you all the time and it's such an important part of the culture. So even if you're not inclined to get into it, there is that, I think oftentimes there's that aspect of I'm missing out. It's like, it's like a little FOMO. Oh yeah. Dude, it's Western PA and Pittsburgh area when it comes to Steelers is like a religion where like I always remember going to church on a Sunday and it was like the kids that would always wear something nice like a button up. It's like, oh, no, you can wear your Steelers jersey <laughs> to church <laughs> and stuff like that. And oh, like yeah, the yep. Steeler jerseys at school and and stuff like that. It was a, it's very, very much a big part of culture around here is. And you were going to school in the Roethlisberger era, too, right? So it was like serious oh, Steelers yeah. shit. I remember there's a very specific game in is either 2006 or 2007 where he was injured and they put the old quarterback in, which was Maddox, maybe. I don't know. And it was, dude, it was bad. It was like, this guy, we don't ever want to see him again. He he totally fucked up. And it was like a, a big event uh, yeah, like in a the Pittsburgh area. Tear yeah. down the city of Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. Lay waste to the city of Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, too, like the, the Steelers won two Super Bowls. In the last 10 or 15 years, I think. And yeah, obviously the dynasty. Yeah. I like kids would like skip school the day after the super yeah, the Super Bowl sure. when Steelers won and they were going to the parade, or even if they weren't going to the parade, they were just like parents like, Yeah, you can just stay home. Who cares? It's Steelers won, you know? <laughs> so so that's my other blind spot. The last thing, and we don't have to get into this too deeply, because I think we have talked about this on Constellation, but it's not really a media related, but mm. the other area that I feel the most self-conscious about is cars. Oh, I don't man. know anything 
about cars. I don't want to say I don't know anything. Like I know some basic maintenance stuff you got to do. But sure. growing up, uh, well, I guess I'll say like in my early adulthood, early 20s, when I was working part time and Holly was working part time going to college, and we you know weren't very well off. It's like we had old shitty cars that needed work. I remember always dreading like taking it to the mechanic and trying to explain to them. And then they would work on it. And you get the call where they explain what's wrong, and what needs done and just be like, man, I have <laughs> no what idea what you're talking about. about. <laughs> or every time, or even like talking to my dad and he's like, Oh yeah, you just need to do this. This is like spouting out all these things. You just got to do. I'm like, dude, no, like I, I have no idea. He's like, oh, and and he was pretty good. Like he would help me fix it. And my, uh, my, my family in general, both my dad, both grandpas on both sides, like and, and beyond cars too, just like extreme fixers and handymen mm. that could yep. fix shit around their house, fix their cars, fix the furnace, fix the water heater. And I've always just been the guy that's like, man, if uh, something goes wrong with your computer. Call me. I, I Maybe might be able to. So you got something. And I have done that before for my grandma. Like she'll call me and I'll, I'll go over and 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 fix her Wi-Fi or whatever and stuff. And I'm I'm happy to do that just because I feel so uh, helpless when it comes to some of these other tasks. And you get better as you become an, a homeowner and you become more independent. That's like okay, you really you either got to figure this shit out. <laughs> or pay out the ass in order to have someone else do it for you. And so, and, and the nice part too, is that family and friends are great for those types of things that if you need something, um, oftentimes I can call somebody, they'll come help me out. But it is a little bit, uh, I guess emasculating in some ways that mm. it's like constantly, it's like, man, I don't know, don't know what to do. I don't I know. That. And it's basic stuff too, often. So it's my other blind spot i'm always trying to get better at that but i feel like i'm just kind of i try not to have the defeatist attitudes like well i'm 30 now so i'm never gonna figure know enough about this stuff (laughs) but i'm still trying to get better when i can but those are it's hard when you're not naturally inclined like i that really speaks to my heart dust because i realized at a certain point early in adulthood we're just like i'm just not good thinking and working in three dimensions like Give me a piece of paper and I'll draw, mm-hmm. but it's just like figure it. I fit. Let me put it to you this way. I fixed like a faulty kitchen drawer that was like such a thorn in my side this morning. And it took me way too long. And I was way too proud of myself when I was finished. And it was just ended in this feeling like you're pathetic, but at least I did something. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Right. Like at least I did something. At least I, I put, you know, my wife, Helene calls it putting my tool belt on because it's like the smallest household job becomes like this huge undertaking. But if you're, if you're making an effort, you know what I mean? Especially when you're not cut out for it. Like, especially when you're saying like your dad, my dad's like a master craftsman, carpenter extraordinaire, like that apple fell so far from the tree. Kyle and I talk about it a lot and we, we can relate on that level. But at least you're making an effort. That's all you could do. Like it would be, it would be like handing my dad a sketch pad and telling me to him to draw Goku. Like yeah. he's not going to be able to do it. So we all have our thing, right? Yeah, and it's funny too because a lot of the stuff with my dad in particular, if he doesn't know how to do something, he'll he'll watch someone on YouTube and then yeah. figure it out. And he, the the thing is, because he's told me before, he's like, well, you learned how to do your job from watching YouTube videos. So you can do this I'm like, yeah, but like in edit is something I can mess around with. And if I if I can't figure it out, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, but when it's my water heater or, <laughs> uh, you know, something in my car, if I fuck it up, it's going to be a major problem. But he's fearless when it comes to this stuff. He's just he'll watch the right amount of YouTube videos and probably take six trips to Home Depot. but. Even even though the the time investment and the frustrations there, it's it's still gonna be way way cheaper than mm-hmm. than than uh, paying someone to do it. So yeah, that's good, and that's good incentive. That's the proper incentive. Yeah, you know, the fearlessness yeah. is important. I think I would say. I mean, for me, this is very on brand for me. But if it's not fun, ultimately, I'm not gonna do it. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not going to get good at it because I just don't enjoy it. So I love cars, but I don't want to work on them. You know, that type of thing. Yeah. But I like with your dad, just that element, maybe he enjoys it, maybe he doesn't, but the, there's that element of, I'm just going to get it done. That's just like good old fashioned blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, dude, my dad, he is, uh, he's totally fearless. He's figured out some, he's like kind of like the MacGyver. Like we, uh, like a random example, we wanted to hang up my, my rear speakers for my thing. And he's like, well, can't drill into the wall, but I have this metal piece that we could screw it into and then bend it and then screw that in the wall. And it's like, it totally worked. I'm like, how did you even think figured it out? do this or like any uh, project if it's like oh you cut this a little too short he's like well we can use this piece and put put this in here and it's like good enough not i don't want to say good enough because that makes it sound lazy but he knows when when you got to go all out and do it right and when it's like oh no this we just need it to work yeah he's very good at that enterprising i like that now you, Brad? What, yeah brad hasn't weighed in on this one yeah you need to hear your blind spots there's any several exist. blind spots in my life that i would like to dive deeper into uh music is definitely one of them like you guys said when i was younger like in my 20s and stuff i was so much more into music and the scene and all that stuff like new artists but like i've just kind of fallen off on a lot of that stuff like i I like a lot of new music i just don't know a lot of it so i mm. it's just something i'd have to dig into and really search, but I just haven't done that yet. Um, it's funny you brought up like uh, your dad, Dustin. A lot of it is like my dad too is extremely handy, and I could do some stuff totally. It's just a lot of it's just learning it as you go, and I've improved a lot over the years. But my dad is insanely good at carpentry, like so good. I don't know how or why he is, but he like built the entertainment center my parents used for their TV. He like built stuff in the house he's like rebuilt the whole fence and crazy stuff like that he's just so good with tools i wish i knew more about that i guess how we were saying a lot of this stuff is just you just kind of learn as you go we just haven't i haven't gotten to that point where i need to like build a fence for my Mm -hmm. house or like fix the roof or we're totally screwed stuff like that but it is something i'd really want to learn a lot about and get better because i do enjoy it i think it's really cool but I just need to do more of it. Same with cooking. I can cook some pretty decent stuff. Like I, I have a lot of the basics done and all that good stuff, but there's so much to it and so much cool and delicious food you can make. If you just really put in the effort and I'd love to learn that. Uh, history is one. I love history. There's just so much out in the world though. Of course, there's so much to learn and I would just, yeah. I feel like I could never know enough about that kind of stuff. And you learn stuff, then you just kind of forget about it over time. So it's always a struggle for me. I get annoyed when I knew I knew something, when I just forgot it. But I think the biggest thing for me is honestly just reading books. I do like, I like books. I've read quite a few, but there's so much literature out there that I know I would probably really enjoy, but I just don't feel like reading that often. Sure. With reading, it's really weird. When I read, I really have to be in a specific mindset, I guess. Mm. And I'm not always in that mindset. I have to feel like very in the mood in the sense like the atmosphere around me or something like that. Like I love reading like at a library or something like that. I can read way more, be way more focused in that kind of environment. But at home, it's much more difficult for me to stay focused, I guess, you know, because we got electronics all around us and all that. So it's tough for me. but. There's so much good literature out there. There's so many great stories, so much just to learn about life in general. You can learn about anything from reading books, you know? Yeah. And I would just love to dive more into that. But I feel like we're always fighting. Something's always fighting for our attention, you know? Mm, sure. And we can only give so many things attention. Like, obviously, video games are my number one thing because it's my favorite thing. And it's also my job. So it all goes goes towards that. But I I do lament that there's not enough time in the day to learn so much stuff out there because it's so great, man. Just experiences. I wish I could just build something really crazy out of just go to Home Depot. Like, oh, I'm just going to go buy some wood and make a fucking chair or something like that. Yeah, you know <laughs> just, who does that is uh, so Dustin, cool. you know, those Jimmy does that. Like, I remember I was asking oh, yeah? him. Yeah, like he he had a really good overhead setup that I kind of wanted for Retro Rebound and he was doing it for like Steam Deck or something like that. 
or his deck ready channel is like hey what do you use for the overhead i'm thinking he's got like tripods and stuff he's like oh, i went to home depot i bought like a piece of wood and he bought like two pipes and just stacked them on top of each other like concaved like one part of the pipe opened up the bottom and just like lays his phone in there and like that's how he gets his top down view and it looks really good i'm like Mm -hmm. how'd you think of that like they're just like my dad is the same way so i i sympathize with that brad that i'm like i wish i had that part of me that builder's mentality that engineer's mind right the engineer's mind is one i greatly envy because they just see everything as a blueprint like everything's a piece of their plan and i think that's such like a powerful asset to have in life itself so i I, i'm right there with you I, i wish i could do that sometimes yeah yeah it's so funny this topic it's just like there's so many things i still need to learn and i want to dive into but it's just like man how who has the time to do all that it sucks i wish i didn't want to know all of this kind of stuff so i'd just be totally content but i just i want more man but i just can't do it (laughs) it's so frustrating so enough hours in the day i know there's not very frustrating it is it really is yeah the the reading you brought up also is one that like i've i realized like i have the time to read and i've been making the time to read but you almost have to force yourself because like we play games so much that that's like you do it's the exact opposite so like when you're into a game whether it be for work or for yourself like i usually like to do reading as like a wind down activity Mm -hmm. so last hour of the day read until my eyes are blurry and they just conk out right so for me, like when I'm playing a good game, though, or I'm just playing something and I'm like, I, I don't want to pull myself away for that last hour. I'm like, oh, I could just get one more hour of rebirth in tonight. Like that. Mm-hmm. That's the wrong with that. That's a great use of my time. And, and you just do that like seven days in a row. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then suddenly mm-hmm. you just haven't read at all. And I've realized like the necessity for me with reading that helps me as a human being truly. And I don't know if there's a science behind this, but it feels like my brain just slows down finally. Like I have to just dial everything back you can't rip through this you know you can't now 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 instant gratification like a re- reading a book's like a process like you have mm-hmm. to page by page word by word i don't know if that's why I've, it's less about like the stories that are told almost like the benefit that it does to me is like a person because i'm always going it feels like it's the one time that just like the breaks that you pull the e-break on me at that point and a book's in front of me so, dude the thing about reading that's funny is like I, I feel like this is the case for everyone. Like I read so little now compared to growing up. Um, but when I do read books as an adult, I'm all, when I finish, I'm like, man, that was awesome. I'm so glad I read that life changing. Like I've, I've talked about reading the subtle art of not giving a fuck uh, last year and how like it was a life changing book. I'm like, man, I should read more often. And that was the last book I read. <laughs> yeah <laughs> a year ago and i just I'll, i always am like man this is great i should do this I'm all the time and then i just book. don't because man it comes back stop. like you said it's like but there's this new game there's yeah. this new show there's you know what this, Dustin, tell me about you this guys, book a little I, bit i've never heard of this well oh, so oh. hard and not giving a fuck yeah <laughs> dude this book is awesome yeah i've heard about this book it's i guess you could put it in the self-help category sure sure yeah. but it doesn't read like one at all it's basically I'm trying to think how to sum it up. It's this idea that you only have so much attention and things to care about. And so often we, <laughs> he puts it in funny ways, like to, to really hit it home. It's like, you only have so many fucks to give in life. Mm. So you really should figure out what's worth giving a fuck about. Mm. And, uh, you know, not that I'm like this, a major anxiety suffer or anything but just like any, anyone else like there's things that bother me that shouldn't and right that book dude so much clarity on like man i'm giving so much of my time and attention to this and ult- it does not matter it doesn't matter so why why am i obsessing over this just give it up give those fucks to something else <laughs> i kind of love that man love just that, like yeah. bending your mentality to like prioritizing the few things you should care about and like leaving it just, just for relieving myself of anxiety or like mm-hmm. you're saying dust, everybody has some degree. I, I understand what you guys are saying comparing games to books because I'm looking at three guys who make a living off of talking about video games and you have to put a lot of bandwidth into that for your livelihood and also for your enjoyment. But I have faith for you guys in reading because reading books and books compared to video games, they're not too unlike each other. Yeah. Right. They're a big, they're both a big, much bigger time commitment than the stuff I tend to go in for and stay up to date with. Film, certainly, I'm I'm very sort of 
um, tied in with that, keeping up with TV and to some degree comic books, much more digestible than the things you guys are doing, which are much big time commitments, like a book. So you guys are already kind of set up. You have the discipline, you have the acumen, mm -hmm. you know, to get into books. It's it's not exactly one to one, but there's a similarity there with it. Books, you know why books are intimidating though? Think of like the body of video gaming, especially like home home console video gaming, right? Books go back so far that your reading backlog is always going to be a hundred times bigger oh, yeah. Yeah. than your video game backlog. So that's what makes it intimidating. And like I said, I think I mentioned where Helene loves to read, but she never knows where to start. You know, we're, it's not like we're in high school English anymore where we're getting kind of brought in a direction, read this, read this. It's like, how do you find out what you would enjoy the most? So you're not wasting time. And then if you pick up a book and you don't enjoy it, that's going to be deter a deterrent for picking up another book. How do you maintain that rhythm of wanting to get, you know, something that you want to spend time with and enjoy? So yeah, that's a hard one. The more you guys talk, it's like, I have all these, I have so many, I have so many blind spots. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what it is, is for me, I think the pitfall we gamers fall into is video games kind of encapsulate all entertainment mediums in one. Like you get your cutscenes, mm. which are kind of like the movie experience. And you have like the art style, which can sometimes emulate like your favorite manga or comics. Uh, you have visual novels, which are, are reading or you're reading dialogue. Like you're engaging in all these similar forms of entertainment, but they're just in this one place. And I think that's why as a kid growing up, like I never longed for movies I didn't care about television because I'm like, why would I play or sorry, here we go. My head's already in the right place. Why would I watch <laughs> something that like is broken up into like half hour, hour, weekly intervals, but I could just have the whole experience at once. Usually <laughs> not all times in games, but usually you just get all the experience at once. It's like, I see this story from start to finish when I want, how I want. Sure. You know, I'm not like limited to where the camera is positioned. Like I can rotate that bitch and look to the left and see what's going on over there. Like, I, that's why I, I think that's the pitfall I get into almost on a daily basis. I'm just like, yeah, it's just like feeding all the needs at once. Like, you know, do I need to read if I'm playing Dang and Rampa? <laughs> like it's, it's like <laughs> the answer is yes, but you know, it's it's a uh, you know, it's a visual novel. So in my head, I'm like, oh, maybe that's like the the cope, if you will. It's the justification, but uh, it's it's something too I've worked on and. Yeah, you know, what I decided to do is I feel like I get over these blind spots when I put a challenge to myself. Um, I started reading Way of Kings, which is like, at least in the version I'm reading, which is like the, the smaller uh, um, paperback, it's like 1,200 pages, which I've, you know, I'm not afraid to admit, I've never read a book that long before. Like I've not, you know, I, most people my age have just because, you know, whether they're very much smarter than me or they've read Harry Potter. Like I always hear like, yeah, I read Harry Potter, which is, to me, that was like the biggest mountain to overcome as a kid. I was like, all my friends had read Harry Potter. I'm like, how do you read like 800, 900 pages? But, you know, I real like my friend proposed this idea of like, let's all just read a book together. Let's check out Way of Kings from Brandon Sanderson. Apparently it's really good. And I'm like, I looked at the page count. Immediately I wanted to shy away. I was like, why don't I just try this? Because if it's such a huge mountain to climb, I overcome it. Then every book's going to look small in comparison, which is a great feeling to have. Oh, it's a great that. deal of power. Uh, and it's already kind of paying off. Like there was one weekend I sat down morning and night. I just read 40 pages each, which told out to 160 pages. And I'm looking at this book that Dustin was suggesting. It's like 224 pages. Normally I'd be like, okay, I think I can muster it. But I'm like, dude, I could bang out that in a fucking weekend. If, yeah. If I really had the time to, like I did that one time. So, you know, I guess that's how I'm trying to, to tackle these blind spots is with a little bit more of an aggressive challenge or or tying it. You know, I know my work, like I love my work. So I'm like, how can I tie this into my work? Like would, and sometimes I'm just like, well, maybe reading this book would enhance something I'll talk about down the line. Like just that knowledge that sometimes overlaps. And and those are things that have pulled me in to, to sort of wipe these blind spots away. But the biggest thing I struggled to accept, which I, I think it was Dustin who said it, is just like, and, and I know Dagan, you followed up on it, is like, you just know you'll never be a master at everything. And that sucks oh. if you want to be good at, I don't want to, I'm like an overachiever, but, but, but like, I do want to learn about everything. I want to have that deep historical knowledge while also deep video game knowledge and enriched book life and movie buff. And I'm like, you can't be all of these at once. Like that's the reason experts exist and different platforms exist because people specialize in different categories. That's why 
you know, you have your plumber and your electrician because they, they can't like overlap, for example. So it's something I've come to grips with over time, but it's, it's like, you know, you want to be like desire to want to be good at everything or know everything. It's just like, it's so hard to, to get rid of. And so you still, even with your blind spots and addressing them, you still got to be picky, right? Like you, you yeah. have to be very selectful of like, what blind spots do I address and accepting that there will always be more. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great way to say it. Very clever. And yeah, it's a, I mean, I love what you're saying, Maddie, about also just the temptation of like, but um, who knows, maybe I could be, a, maybe I could be brilliant at this. But also what Dustin's saying too, as far as like spending fucks, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I, I, I kind of love that. I love kind of tying up both of those things, Yeah, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, well, Maddie, what do you think? Are you satisfied? Very Maddie? satisfied. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well done. All right, you guys. Well, this brings us to the last topic. A bat clean up for this one. I wanted to float the idea of our bad ideas. Just bad ideas to you guys. I'm lazy, so I'll read part of the email. I'll paraphrase the email I sent you guys. I said, let's talk about our bad ideas, our harebrained schemes. The kids might say are epic fails. <laughs> Something that maybe seemed like a great idea initially, but ended up falling flat, maybe even ending in disaster. Now, as I said to you guys, this could be a moment from your childhood or something more recent. And then I named some examples. I said, for instance, maybe eating your weight in sushi at that late night, all you can eat buffet that one time wasn't the wisest choice. But in any event, notions that are so clearly idiotic in retrospect, thinking back, but at the time thinking were absolutely brilliant or invincible. I love that idea of like, were you one of those kids who decided to jump off the garage roof? You know, that's just, that's, it's tragic, but it's also funny to me. And it's only after these ideas end up failing miserably that we realize how dumb we actually were. Therein lies the potential comedy. So I think what kind of steered me to this idea was I was thinking the other day of one of those harebrained schemes I had as a kid. I was a college kid. And I'll tell you guys the story before I kick it over to you guys. This one's funny, but th- it's one of those things where thinking back, it was so it was so stupid on so many levels. But it still makes me laugh. And I still remember it so vividly. So I left for college when I was 20. I moved from New York to Philly. And I was going to art school. And I was in a fortunate position because I had two friends that were a little older than me that mo- both moved to Philly a year ahead of me to go to the same art school. One was a graphic designer and one was in my animation major as well. So I already had friends in Philly. So when I moved there, I was able to move into their apartment with them. So I kind of skirted the whole new roommate situation. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a fortunate position to be in. And back then, my school, our dorm situation was really kind of cool. I didn't realize how good I had it at the time, but my school had a deal with these high rise apartments. They're still there. Shout out Parktown Place. You could see these 40 story, there's four 40 story high rise apartments in a cluster. And you could see them from like the Rocky Steps, right in the art museum district of, you know, where Center City meets North Philly. And Beautiful apartments, and that was our dorm situation. So we were in actual proper apartments living amongst people that actually paid to live there. It wasn't a retirement community, but it seemed like a lot of aged or more elderly people lived in these buildings. So thinking back, I felt really bad for them because now they're mixing them up with a bunch of rowdy art students. But I moved into my friend's apartment that they already had, so I became like the third one. It was like a two-bedroom So it was intended for up to four people. It was only three of us. So it was kind of cool. And at that time, I was dating a girl who still lived in New York. So (laughs) I don't know what what the conceit was here, but the year before I moved, I took a year off between high school and college. The year I graduated from high school, that next year, she bought me a cat for Valentine's Day. And my dad was furious. He's like, I don't want another cat. I already had a cat. Now we had a second cat. My dad didn't want it, but he eventually sort of um, gave in and said, okay, you can keep the cat. Mm -hmm. Very grudgingly, but he was very upset at me because he knew he was going to be taking care of the cat. I wasn't feeding the cat. I wasn't changing the litter box. Now I had two. So it was pretty bad. 
And I was fixing the move to school, but I still had a certain length of time to spend at home. And my dad didn't want the cats. Now he's got two cats. And I think, I guess it's important to note, like my fa- my parents were so anal retentive and particular about the house growing up that we never had any pets. I never had, mm-hmm. I had a pet. I was allowed to have a pet scorpion once. Whoa. No That's cats, no dogs. Whoa. Like I didn't grow up with, we grew up longing for actual pets my entire life. So now he had two cats. He was kind of saddled with them. Well, cut to the next Valentine's Day. My I'm in college now. I started college a few months prior. I started a real weird time. I started like right after the holidays. So now it's like February. So now I'm in Valentine's. I'm I'm in college for like two months. And my girlfriend buys me another cat for Valentine's Day. So this is back to back Valentine's Days, back to back cats for some reason. I don't know. Wow. It's like I was at, at my wish list wasn't a bunch of cats. She just, I don't know. She loved cats and she wanted to give me cats. I don't know. So my, I couldn't, now I lived in the dorms. We weren't allowed to have pets. So I go home, I'm visiting home on winter break. And I'm like, dad, Megan gave me another cat. You're going to, and he was like, before I could even get the sentence out, he was like, absolutely not. I don't know what, I don't care what you have to do. You're lucky. I, you, you're lucky. I don't get rid of these two that are already here. You're not, you got to take the cat with you. And the cat was a kitten. Oh. So I was like, all right, so I, I got to figure this out. So now I'm between a rock and a hard place. Now, this is another important aspect of the story. My two friends, which who I knew for years, like let's say we, we, these specific friends were skateboarding friends. So I probably met them when I was like 13. So we'd had a history together of seven or eight years. We knew each other and we were on good terms, but nobody in my life liked this girl I was dating already for a couple of years. Nobody. Like I remember my grandfather grabbing me by the arm once on a vit when we were leaving a visit from his house. And he's like, you got to watch this one type of thing out. And no, to a person, everybody was like, this girl's no good. And it was like one of those things, like I couldn't see the forest for the trees, Mm. but nobody liked this girl, including my friends, including my two friends who I live with in Philly. So they already kind of had an ax to grind with me because she was always out. She was always in town. She was staying for the weekend and she was very loud and she was obnoxious and she was kind of standoffish and aloof. And I think, yeah, she just had a bad energy. I mean, in retrospect, I didn't really realize at the time. At the time, honestly, it was just like, she's hot. You know what I mean? Like I, <laughs> That was it. That was my singular perspective, but she was pretty miserable. <laughs> and my friends didn't dig her. My friends just didn't dig her and I couldn't see it or I couldn't acknowledge it or I didn't want to. And when I got the cat and brought it back to the Philly apartment to our dorm and they found out it was from her, well, that was it. That was too much to bear for them. So to make a long story short, they turned me in to the school. <laughs> and so they just completely, they have had, they had it with me. I guess they had it with her. They had it, you know, with us as a unit and they reported me and lo and behold, I get called down to the, what, whoever the housing administrator at my college was at that time. I remember her coming up to the animation floor. I was like scribbling at my animation desk or whatever, doing a pencil test. I don't know what I was doing. And she actually came up and told me to come down to the second floor. It was like an eight story building downtown of Philly. And I sat with her and she's like, look, we know you have a cat. Um, You have like 48 hours to get rid of it or we're kicking you out. And she wasn't saying she was going to kick me out of the dorm. She was saying I was going to get kicked out of school. And so what, what ended up happening was this whole situation got conflated because I was already failing out of school as it was. Like I was failing every class. Um, I think my all my electives, like I wasn't going, I was kind of showing up when I wanted to. It was like when I went to college, it was like 13th and 14th grade. It was like, I, it, I, it was just an extension of how bad I did in high school. It was terrible. And I guess they were kind of looking to off me anyway. It was like, what do we need this guy here for type of thing? So it was like, listen, you have 48 hours. This is your ultimatum. Got to get rid of the cat. So at that time, things got so strained between me and my two friends that they were already telling me things like we're putting the cat in the microwave. And I didn't know whether to believe them or not. Like they were like, yeah, like 
it, it, it came out, one of them told, one of them got really pissed at me about a water bill or something. And then it was like, yeah, well, we put the cat, we put the cat in the microwave for 10 seconds yesterday or something like that. And I honestly didn't know they were so frustrated with me that I honestly didn't know whether to believe them or not. <laughs> like they were, they were threatening me. They were telling me weird shit. And it was all over this girl and the way this girl was impacting my friendship with, you know, these friends who I grew up with, but this whole thing had happened. So I tried to keep the cat there and just ignore the fallout. But apparently what ended up happening was the cat got fleas. And now the entire apartment, I don't even know how it happened to be honest with you, because I don't know the nature of how fleas happen, but if this was a pet free apartment, I'm not even sure how it could have happened. I don't know. I don't know how, how fleas work, but this thing got fleas. It really got fleas. And now my, my roommates totally had it. I was already way past that 48 hour ultimatum that I was granted to, you know, get rid of the cat. And I ended up getting kicked out. I stayed with the girl. I stayed with the cat. There was really nothing else for me. I couldn't do anything with the cat. And I ended up getting kicked out of school. I ended up getting kicked out of the apartment and getting kicked out of school. And I had to move in. I had the option to move home. But I just decided to move in with a friend who lived outside of school housing, like it's just in a regular shitty apartment, like just into South Philly. And I dropped out of school for a year. Now it happened that, and I was just like, at some point during that time off, it ended up working out. Like I got my head straight. I went back to school after that year. I saved up a little money to go back and I graduated. You know, I had like two years left, I think. And I ended up graduating with like a 4.0 average. It worked out. But I stuck to my guns with this girl, with this cat. And it was probably the stupidest thing I've ever done because who the hell knew, who knew how it would turn out once I got kicked out of college? You know, that whole thing. So that was a story that seemed like, yeah, that was like one of your first bad ideas of just being out of your teens. It was like one of my, it's, it certainly wasn't my last terrible idea, but it was probably my first adult bad idea was being with this girl and everything that kind of sprung out of it. It manifested in the cat situation, but it was a much bigger problem than that. And bo- by the way, both guys, super good terms with even to this day, but that was a blip for us on the radar where it was like that our friendship maybe wouldn't have endured that if we weren't, you know, if we didn't have it so good. You know, if we didn't have all those good times in the bank, right? It might have might have might have went bad. It might have went south. Went sour for the friendship. Wow. So, I'll kick it over to you guys, um, Brad. Tell me, <laughs> tell me a bad idea. Could be a childhood thing. Could be a, a recent thing. Uh, sure, I could tell you some bad ideas. I guess uh, more dumb ideas, I suppose. <laughs> uh, it's funny because we were talking about amusement parks earlier. Uh, me and a bunch of my friends were probably twenty. Everyone, Jack Daniels, baby. Everyone. Oh, Jack Daniels <laughs> in the car, snuck some in. Everyone's getting wasted, going on the roller coasters. So many people got sick. Oh, so many people. I remember uh, this ride, Goliath. It, like, it was like a humongous coaster. Dude. I remember just one of my really good friends <laughs> going around a turn. He just fucking, I looked at him. He just puked off the side while oh, it was dude. going. We were so <laughs> high up, dude. And I just started laughing at him. And I remember we were walking across a bridge or over some water. And one of my friends just did the most casual puke I've ever seen. Just went <laughs> real quick, just real quick and kept going. Like nothing happened. Yeah, we were probably just really stupid and obnoxious, I imagine. Uh, one was also at, so at the beach, this place called The Wedge. It's a very intense place, very popular with like bodyboarders. It's a very advanced part of Newport Beach. So it's very, the water is, or it's very shallow, but it gets very huge waves. So like, let's say you're riding a wave, you fall, you're going to, there's a good chance you just might hit the sand to get a wave just smashed on you instead of falling into some water at least uh i got overconfident a little cocky i would say and went out there when i probably shouldn't have on some big days 
and I ate shit so hard. <laughs> I like almost drowned. I like almost fucking died that day because I just got too overconfident and I was just like, okay, <laughs> never again. I'm not doing that ever again. That was like the day I I, re- I feared the ocean the most I'd ever feared it before. I was like, all right, I'm just not, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going on those huge waves. And um, yeah, I remember Dagan and I, I was in college. I uh, I dropped out of college eventually to go to beauty school, and that was what the path I went. Oh, for. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but I remember that, yeah. um, I was just fucking ditching class so much. I don't know why I was doing it. I was just stupid. Just didn't want to be there. Just being dumb. Luckily, it was community college, so it wasn't like expensive. Mm. So I wasn't like, and it was local. You know, I didn't like move somewhere crazy like that. So it was fine. But like, just like, why did I just not go to class? What was I thinking? Why? It's so easy. What was I doing? I don't know why I just wasn't doing it. But I'm just like, man, I was such an idiot when I was younger. Of course, when you're younger, you think you know everything and you're yeah. invincible. Oh, you Nobody could tell invincible. you anything. Yeah, yeah, just like skateboarding, of course, digging into, you know. Just I wanted to talk to you about that. Dumb, yeah. huge shit that I had no business doing. Luckily, <laughs> I never got like super hurt. I never broke a bone or anything. Mm, you lu- you lucked I out. I lucked out yeah. big time. But like, I look back at some of this stuff. I'm like, dude, what am I? What was I doing, man? Like, dude. I can't believe I give myself the willies with skateboarding memories because even if it wasn't, I guess it does come back to that evil Knievel sort of thrill seeker thing, or at least having a little bit of that inside you. But like just doing like a rail and filming and the rail like shoots into traffic or just weaving amongst like the Philly buses and taxi cabs or, you know, doing something that, you know, was a little too high in terms of the amount of stairs or whatever. When I think back, and to not have, like when you're a kid, you don't have that danger filter. Right. Or at least everybody has it to a much less degree. And then when you get old, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that shit or I attempted that. So I think every skateboarder, ha- I did have some pretty shitty injuries, but it was even beyond getting hurt. It was just like that, that thing of tempting fate. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like, you know, it's dangerous, but that inclination to do it and sort of downplay the danger mm. and sort of upgrade. I don't know if it, what is it? Is it glory? Is it just know. fun? It's probably just fun. It's just fun. You know, you just, you, you, you just kind of ignore the danger side or you don't yeah. have that. You don't have that voice. You don't have that devil on yeah. your shoulder yet. It's not fully formed where it's yeah. like, dude, that's a, that's a really shitty idea. Everyone else you're doing it with too is, has the same mentality. Everyone's just like, oh, let's just do it. And like, you're no one's each really other on. thinking this through. Yeah. It's like, yeah, oh, well, you're you totally do it, kind of thing like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like a recipe for disaster. Like we broke into a skate park. I remember at like one mm. in the morning, it was an outdoor one. Classic. And Classic. Um, we we're skating. It was fine. One of my friends just broke his leg while we were in there. Oh, dude. No. We didn't get caught, but we had to like get him out of there, dude. It was just such a pain in the ass. And that was the last time we did that as well. Brad, it's so funny that you mentioned this. I have a friend who I grew up skating with that skates still very regularly, mm-hmm. like much more regularly than anybody else we grew up with. He lives in San Francisco. He works in Silicon Valley for Cisco Systems, an engineer. He's brilliant. He's probably a millionaire by now, but he still skates actively. And that very thing happened to him last year. One of his neighbors, who's about our age, they were skating. They broke into a skate park. His friend busted his leg. I think it was a compound fracture of his femur. And they had to get him out there with his bone sticking out of his leg, oh. hoisting him over the fence. No. Now he's, if I'm 50, I think my friend Jeff and his friend are like 48, 49. And dude, can you imagine? Like, I can't imagine that in my teens or early in my 20s, mm-hmm. but that's the whole thing. They broke into a skate park. Same exact thing. Dude busted his leg. And they were going to get, you know, I guess, I don't know how the laws are in NorCal, but I guess it wasn't worth getting busted sure. or the cops coming. So they just tried to get out of there on the sly. Dude, that's so, yeah. that's so <laughs> scary. Yeah, it's terrifying, man. <laughs> oh, dude, skateboarding. Unbelievable. I would have never, that's why you got to start when you're young. That's why my, yeah, I, it's a young man's I game. don't push my son too hard, but it's like, you got to start now. You know, yeah. he's 13. I started when I was oh, 13. Great age. Yeah, great age. It's the perfect age. Yeah. You know, can't drive I mean? yet. 
can't skate drive. everywhere. I love yeah. that point. Can't drive. Got you, you're you're starting to build your athleticism, but you don't have the fear yet. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have the voice in your head telling you not to try things. And you know, like yeah, I I kind of hope he finds it. I'm constantly trying to lead that horse to water, but I don't want to <laughs> be too pushy. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because he's got to figure out his own thing. You know. But yeah, it's like now's the time. Like we got to strike while the iron's hot, type of thing, you know. Yeah. So, all right, my friends. Well, what do you think, Dust? Mm. Talk to me about some bad ideas, some harebrained schemes. Yeah. So I was pretty, and I still am. I've always been very risk averse. So my, <laughs> uh, luckily, I haven't had anything too catastrophic. But I can think of two instances, and one that I was only passively involved with so we'll start with the one because it was more recent this was uh march of 2020 so right before the pandemic hits i'm at pax east with the boys Mm. and uh as you may know uh marijuana very legal in massachusetts in boston Mm. so this is what the boys would do we would go work the show come back go get dinner and then you know, just get baked out in the night. <laughs> Lots of fun. So I'm no Colin Moriarty. OK, when it comes to this, I'm not like anything is fine, whatever. But the bad idea comes in the day we go to leave where my friend Brandon, who gets mentioned often on this show, Brad, mm-hmm. you know, him from playing Hell Divers sure with him. Do. He's going to be in New York. So uh, Dang, you'll okay. get to meet him. Nice. Mm, cool. He. The last day was like, oh, yeah, I bought this joint. Um, we got to use it before we before we go, before we leave. I'm like, OK, so we're all packed up. We've got all of our bags in the Airbnb. We go out on the back deck to smoke this joint. And I'm like, yeah, hey, I don't I know I'll, I'll probably get a little nervous. And I, I, I get, you know, I just I'm not at, like I said, I'm not hardcore. I take like two little hits of this right we're standing there and i'm like oh 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 okay i'm gonna go <laughs> i'm gonna go inside i'm telling you guys like there i don't know if it just hits me different or whatever and i remember like immediately from opening the door and like each step it's like boom boom like you feel like you're pushing the earth down and i go sit on the couch and i'm like oh no we have to we have we have to leave this airbnb at i think it was one and our we have to be at the airport at five. <laughs> so we have four hours in Boston where we have no home base and I'm blasted right now. <laughs> so it, at that point, it just is like, OK, survival, survival mode engage because and I'm going to rely on <laughs> the other guys who are also hitting this joint, which luckily, I mean, Brandon Brandon is extremely experienced. He's like for a while he was doing the it's like uh, the super concentrated that looks like you're doing drugs where you've got the torch and the glass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was he's hardcore. Um, so I just remember walking around Boston. I'm carrying my heavy camera equipment. We've got our bags with us. Like, oh, um, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? We have to get to the airport. Luckily. We went to this pizza shop and I kind of I like I remember ordering and being like, man, this guy, he knows <laughs> the, the cost is like he knows we're, he knows, we're totally dude. out of it. He know he knows we're high. And, uh, you know, we got pizza and it ended up being totally fine. But I'll never forget that moment of walking back into the Airbnb and like, oh, no, oh, <laughs> yeah. four hours. You're A similar thing happened at an E3 where only not to me where we had uh, like these edible gummies left over. And it was like, Oh, well the, the one guy was like, there's two left. I'm not throwing one of them away. So I'm taking both of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we were in LAX. I remember sitting there and I remember looking at him and he was just like, just like had his hands over his face. <laughs> I'm like, dude, are you all right? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I'll get through this. <laughs> and when we got we got back to Pittsburgh, and we're like, "Were you good, dude?" He's like, "Oh yeah." He's like, "I was so stressed." He's like, "I saw this guy who had a, he like was sitting by it and he had his backpack beside him." I'm like, he's got a bomb. 
<laughs> he's got a bomb in the backpack. He, we're like, what? He's like, yeah, he was just a totally normal guy. But uh, something about his backpack just bothered me. So got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Yep. <laughs> now, your limits. Sacred 300 is coming up. Is this? Uh, oh, shit. What do you think? Is this prophesizing things to come or what? <laughs> I, uh, for me, that's like a very much at home thing now. We'd like, I don't know. I don't like to be out and about. Uh, I hear that. That's, that's a little much. But uh, I'm definitely, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to get like blasted in terms of drinking at Sacred 300, but Brad and I have already decided we're going, what do you say, lightly hard? Like not full going oh, yeah. hard. But- I'm going as hard as I can from someone in their mid 30s. Like, I'm not getting, I don't <laughs> want to be like fucked up for three days after. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know my okay. limits nowadays. Yeah. Okay. Within reason. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah, I like it. The The second one, this is one that, I wasn't directly involved with, but I was part of the planning stages is me and my friends in, I think this was eighth or ninth grade. We were, I mean, we were the, the, the nasty scene kids. Okay. Ooh. Not nasty. We were, I mean, we had our hair very well, kempt, nice. We were always like wearing band shirts. We were in bands going to shows and stuff like that. And, uh, my one friend had this idea for a new move in the mosh pit. This is uh, experimental <laughs> groundbreaking stuff. Oh boy. The idea was, so you know, like when you're, you're a kid or something like one person holds the person's legs and the other person kind of walks on their hands and it's like yes. a wheelbarrow. Yes. The idea was, is that you'd go into the pit and one person would grab the legs and they would launch them up in the air and be like a, a like yep. an attack wheelbarrow mm. situation <laughs> here. Yep. So they, this was like orchestrated, like they plan this out. They practice it in this very backyard. They're like, man, this is going to be sick when we get to the, the fire hall <laughs> <laughs> this weekend. And uh, so I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't the one doing part of this, uh, this move, this awesome pit move. But I was, like I said, there, part of the planning. And uh, yeah, so they, they, they pulled it. They, they, you know, the, the mosh pit is starting. The, the hardcore bands, they're playing. And uh, within 30 seconds, totally dislocates his elbow. Uh, yeah. Just immediately <laughs> popped out of its socket. Uh, had to, I remember my mom and I went with him to the, to the ER <laughs> to get it like his x-ray and stuff. And it's like, man, that was, that was like written on the wall. Uh, <laughs> that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here's the thing in the pit man you got to take risks you're a risk you're already taking a risk yeah if you're in the pit you're already taking risks Mm. honestly i was never big into moshing but i i dabbled occasionally yeah until until there was it was was cringy though yeah (laughs) yeah eventually you realize it's cringy and then one one time at uh this music festival i used to go to for like a week in illinois cornerstone uh, oh yeah, we were all moshing together, and I got hit in the nose like three oh. days in a row in oh. the same spot. <laughs> oh. And by the third day, I don't think that I fractured my nose, but like I was touching it, and it felt like moving slightly different. Mm. It's like you know what, I'm done. That's I'm it. hanging up the towel. Yeah. Dustin's That's mosh it. pit career <sighs> is over. <laughs> if this, if someone breathes like brushes my nose even slightly, I'm gonna get fucked up. It's not happening anymore. So, so yeah, the wheelbarrow mosh pit move. Uh, Don't do it. Wasn't meant to be, but I'm Don't so glad it. that it happened. You know, we had to be forerunners. Yeah. Uh, those doing the experiments. There's and always not all some, experiments work. There's always some fucking chuckleheads like that <laughs> in a pit doing some <laughs> dumb gimmick shit like that. And they always <laughs> usually <laughs> fit spectacularly. <laughs> now, okay, Brad, you've, You've opened up the conversation a little bit. Yes. What about what about Brad Ellis in the mosh pit? What about mm. I, I dabbled a little bit? Yes. This was like the very <laughs> dabbled in the mosh pit. <laughs> Just very dabbling. early two thousands. Yeah. I did. I wasn't like the mosh, and I wasn't the tough core kid standing at the side of the pit like this. Oh yeah. There, you there's know, always those. And they, they put out yeah. the arm like this, like yeah. the defense arm. That it's like they they've got their girl beside them, and they're like trying to act tough. It's like, bro, yeah. get out of get yeah. out of there. You don't need to be there if you're going to be <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the tough guy. It's like I would have a little fun, but not. it wasn't my main focus ever. 
And like, I just didn't want to get hit in the face by some random spin kick by some <sighs> dweeb or some shit. You know, it just fucking happens. But uh, yeah. yeah, guys, I this did, is why yeah. you go to hip hop shows. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's none of this. And what, well, let me ask you guys a question. As somebody who I don't know how, but almost impossibly managed to stay out of that whole scene, even though I skateboarded for so many years, are there different levels? of intensity or severity depending on like who's playing and stuff and how does that work yes yeah i remember specifically for some of the bands i liked i knew when it you got had to be careful for certain songs the breakdown (laughs) because you're like this breakdown's coming up yeah watch out and you can feel the energy of this crowd and i've seen this band play this song before and uh it's not going to be a pretty sight now and there's brett I, i don't know if you can agree if if you felt this too, but like Mm -hmm. certain fans of different bands brought different energies. Like yeah, certain bands that were, I don't know. I noticed because I'll tell you the red flags right away, dude. Yeah. Okay. Basketball shorts, immediate red flag. (laughs) This guy's a psychopath. This guy's a psychopath wearing the Nike, like Cortez is too. immediate psychopath. I love this this guy. Um, and that always applied. Yeah, usually oh, anyone wow. you can tell because these guys always or they wear like a hat with the rim bit, like a sports hat or something yeah. like that. All the tough core guys, yeah, those guys always mm. stay away from those psychopaths. <laughs> yeah, always. <laughs> Growing up, I was very much in the like Christian hardcore, which mm-hmm. I know sounds like an oxymoron to a lot of people, but <laughs> people know, no, like, um. Face Down Records and like even Solid State, like Under Oath, Norma Jean, and also like, yeah. like War of Ages, For Today, stuff like that. All spectrum. Dude, of. Under Oath was like my first show ever in like 2003 oh, nice. or something. Yeah. It's crazy. Dude, I remember there was this band. Um, They're called The Chariot. Do you know yeah, them, I, Brad? I, I recognize that name. Yeah. They always had the, mo- the most insane shows where like I remember one Cornerstone Maybe I'm misremembering this, but I don't care to look it up because I like my memory better. The bassist <laughs> had this thing that he wasn't going to cut any of his hair for like an entire year just to see what happened. I remember there's this thing like he was known for like kind of launching himself and playing bass on the crowd. Oh, I don't remember. I think that someone like brought a, a battery shaver and they started shaving this guy <laughs> while he was playing bass. Wow. During the show. Oh, that is unhinged. Yeah. Wow. They would do all kinds. Like they would yeah, like psychos, tear apart dude. the drum set while the guy was playing it. And like it was it was chaos. Yeah. But yeah. but yeah, the, the vibe of different bands was always interesting because like I said, the the Christian hardcore bands, it was very community. People were picking each other up. Yeah. They weren't out there to fucking kill each other, though. There always was like, you know, couple, like you said, there's a guy doing a swing kick gets a little yeah. too close. Wow. Uh, but some like, dude, I remember going to Warp Tour for the first time and I was I wasn't moshing there, but I was seeing it. It's like, dude, yeah, I've seen a couple of those. These guys are are trying to harm each other. Yeah, and there was definitely people in there that were bad actors for sure. Yeah. Trying to get away with stuff. You got to be careful. The bad actors. I don't understand the, pit, the rules. Man. I don't understand the rules. Maddie, uh, what do you know about moshing? What do you what do you got for? And what do you and, got for? Yeah, bad the reason ideas? I was quiet is because I'm not really crazy about like concerts or anything. It's just never been my <laughs> scene. So, yeah, it's it's like I, I don't have any input at all when it comes to moshing personally. It, you know, it, I feel like Dustin's a bit of a thrill seeker is what I'm learning today. Mm. You know, this guy loves to run no, toward the danger of amusement park. <laughs> he wants to run through the danger in his own concerts. Listen to his favorite music. <laughs> Punch me in the face, will you? So what I've learned about Dustin today, he likes to risk it all and is in the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> I would call it uh, controlled risks purely yes, yeah. because yeah, we came to like skateboarding or anything. Here. I was a, I was a bitch. Like there was too much open ended risk for things to go, mm-hmm. to go wrong. Like sure. very, very badly, but it's just me. Yeah, man. The, uh, the mosh pits, crazy place. I don't miss it. Yeah. But, I look at I it nowadays. I'm like, ugh. Just like, no. Have you guys aged out of a mosh pit? Yeah. Fuck no. I don't give a shit about that. Okay. I like going to shows. If I go to show, I just want to watch the band. Essentially. (laughs) Like, I don't care about any of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I I like seeing it from a distance. I think if I'm at a show, but yeah. And it's funny too now because there's bands like many people know one of my favorite bands thrice. I remember seeing them 
when I was in high school and it was crazy people, not necessarily like moshing, like we think for hardcore shows, but like people pushing each other around stage diving mm-hmm. and stuff. But as I've gotten older <laughs> and the, the, the fans of uh, thrice have also aged with the band. It's so much more tame. Now I'm like, man, I remember when I thought you were going to die during the song yeah. <laughs> and now, uh, and now it's pretty everyone's, chill. Cause we're all, everyone's a bunch of dads and stuff now just hanging out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but that's okay. That's evolution. That's got to, yeah, exactly. that's, that's the way it goes. That. Yeah. I like it. Maddie, you haven't talked to us about your, but you're a smart yeah, dude. I, I, I was even the I was best of us. Recounting the tales of your from Mr. <laughs> Maddie and just seeing which ones I wanted to share that I thought would be a good time, you know, watching me get into all sorts of shenanigans or imagining it, I suppose. We'll start innocent. We'll start simple, start nice and easy. Boogie boarding. Uh, not Boogie much of a boarding. beach guy. Yeah, not much of a beach guy. If you couldn't tell by my skin well, tone, just you know, <laughs> the fact that you said boogie boarding makes you very much not a beach guy right away. Wait, really? Okay, what's yeah. it called? <laughs> Everyone calls it bodyboarding. Bodyboarding. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's what, what I grew up on. This like thing. fucking like ten year olds and shit, <laughs> or like eight year olds. I was very young at the <laughs> yeah. time. To be fair, so yeah, boogie boarding. We'll call it for now. And on these, what, what do you call them? The body boards? Like the, yeah. the object is so, all right. So yeah. on the body board, um, they have, a, I think, like a strap of some kind that mm-hmm. ties to your wrist yeah. and there's a rope. And so um, I think I was in, man, I don't remember where the hell I was. I just know I was super young and almost lost my life. Um, but nonetheless, I, you know, you, you run out into the ocean pretty much. You wait for the wave to crash. You know, you try to jump on the board and ride it out. And so first time you ride it out and, you know, my board kind of hits the sand and I face plant. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever, you know, splash some water in my face. I'm like, that was fun. You know, I hit that wave pretty good. Let's do that again. And I, (laughs) I go to hit this wave and I guess the way it came in, it kind of, it tips me over. So I'm, Mm -hmm. you know probably 10 steps in, but I'm small and I'm young. So I fall underwater and like cloud strife's buster blade, this boogie board just kind of stabs diagonally into the ground with the cable across my neck. And mind you, I'm like, how old at this point? So I'm like struggling to, because I I think it came off. Something happened where I was literally pinned down underwater by the neck, by, by this board. Oh my God. Yeah. And I was, that was terrifying. And so I, I remember I managed to just to, to, to break loose because, I mean, you know, it's the sand, right? So it wasn't too hard. But it was one of those moments where I was like, never again. So that was a it's a low level bad idea. I was like, I, I, I've never been a big ocean kid. You know, I like to build sand castles, not dive into the great unknown. <laughs> I tempted fate. I was I was paid handsomely for my attempts and I walked away with my life. So I figured I'll never do that again. So we moved to. Sixth grade. Um, it was my birthday. And my birthday is June 20th. So it kind of circles around where school would end. Um, and this happened to be the last day of school for me. in uh, Or one of the last days of school for me before finals uh, in sixth grade. And I remember, like, I was definitely, like, a, I would say a poser in middle school. And that, like, I just wanted to fit in a little bit. I wouldn't, like, bully anyone or be an asshole to anyone to fit in. But. Yeah, I like what they like. I try to, you know, find my niche because like I was the kid who quietly liked anime and I knew that would make me a total loser. So I was like, you know, <laughs> trying to be a skater, trying to fit in, all that shit. So um I remember this I forgot his name. I think his, his name was like LJ or something like that. But he was uh walking around with like his pants around his knees. And he was doing it as some sort of joke. So me being the absolute dumbass follower I am, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do the same thing. So this kid gets away scot-free. Of course, I drop my pants and who turns the corner but our teacher. And I'm sitting there with like my pants borderline around my ankles. I'm just like, oh, fuck. (laughs) So (laughs) she immediately like we were, by the way, this is in the dying moments of the school day. Like I am maybe three minutes from leaving the classroom and going on my bus. Dude, you're almost there. Yeah. And this is, again, like one of the final days of school. It's my birthday. So I was feeling myself. I was like, let me just drop, drop trow here. And uh, yeah, so she snatches me. She's like, we're going to the principal's office. Now, this is a first for me. I was, you know, I wouldn't say I was a, 
a, like a, a great kid. I had my troublemaking phase, but you know, this is, this is an, uh, an area I had not been taken to in my life. Uh, but she, you know, so I go to the principal's office and they give me the phone and they're like, all right, you got to call your mom and tell them what happened. I'm like what? Like, yeah, you got to tell, call her and tell her what you did. So now I got to sit there in front of an audience and call my mother and tell her that I dropped my pants in front of the whole class and was running around like an idiot. And I remember my mom's just like clear disappointment in her voice. And they they wouldn't let me ride the, the bus home from school. So she had to leave work early, oh, come pick me no. up. So now I've disrupted her day beyond just being an embarrassment. So now she's got to come pick me up. And I remember uh, it was, you know, since it was my birthday, you know, I'm sitting there thinking like, damn, I'm fucked for today. Now, my mom is a very awesome woman. And she, the coolest thing she did was when we got out of the car, I'm like, damn, I'm so fucked. Like that. I think maybe because I already knew it was so dumb that perhaps this is why she acted this way. Because I think otherwise she would have scolded me. But she's like, we got out of the car. She's like, you're lucky it's your birthday. And that was it. So a bad idea that goes pretty well in the end of it all. I don't nice. get suspended for dropping my pants good because I had, I had, you know, good grades and I wasn't a bad kid. They just understood. I was trying to fit in. She told me not to do it again. It scared the life out of me by bringing me to the principal's office, humiliated me in front of my family. So there's that. You had a glitch. I mean, yeah. that speaks to middle school, right? It's like, you just, you never know. The, the, like the, the craziest shit happens. You do the most off-brand stuff. You yeah. Know, it, this speaks mm-hmm. to junior high school. Oh, I mean, it, I, got, I it. it gets worse. It does get worse, <laughs> but... Yeah, because I did like little things. Like, this is one of the stories. But like, I remember I used to like to get my friends in trouble. So I remember uh, in like English class in seventh grade, like I I dive bombed a bunch of desks and chairs and toppled them over and and said my friend shoved me and he got kicked out of the class for it. So like, <laughs> like I just like to, to to fuck with my friends in that way. So yeah, it, my troublemaking phases were just beginning here, I would say. But where the screw really comes loose here I forgot what point this was in my life, but Dustin brought up smoking, and this is why the story came to mind. Of course, what is a bad idea without some sort of drug or alcohol involved? Mm -hmm. This is my first time smoking. So I'm like, well, all I know is that weed chills you out is what I've been told. I'm like, you know, at this time I'm going through a breakup. I'm like, fuck it, man. That sounds great to me. I could, I could relax. Now I, what we smoked out of, I would never recommend <laughs> ever, was a, uh, I think a Mountain Dew bottle and like tin foil, like just oh. not <laughs> good shit. Worse yet, <laughs> worse yet, I take twenty hits my first time doing twenty. Oh, oh, oh yes. hell yeah! That is not an exaggeration. Damn. But camera counted because we were just going in a circle, just passing yeah. around, and because I thought it was you feel it immediately. I was like, I don't feel relaxed yet. I don't feel relaxed. So I keep going. And I remember walking down the hill to my friend's house to go back inside. And Dustin, you mentioned like the thudding. And I was like, something feels off. And it wasn't until I walk inside and I, I touched the wall just to like lean against it. And I like leaned against the couch afterwards. And I was like, I stopped and I felt the wall and I felt the couch. And I was like, yeah, why do these two feel the fucking same right now? Like it just, <laughs> it was immediately a switch flipped in me. And I had absolutely the worst panic attack of my life. Like I was freaking the fuck out. I was telling my friends, get a knife upstairs, stab me. Like this is that bad. I was looking for the phone. I was like, I'm calling an ambulance. We're all fucked anyway. Yeah. Like I was about to sink the whole ship with me. I was like that out of my mind. I slept it off. I woke up fine. And it was a good, it's been a joke amongst my friends for years now. But yeah, my first time, I think that defined why I just ended up not really smoking much throughout uh, my college life and whatnot, because I just had a horrible first time, completely lacking in knowledge. But yeah, like that was a that was a bad idea for me just to just to go so liberally into it with 20 hits on a a Mountain Dew bottle. Do not recommend. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Maddie, do you feel like. uh... Uh, cause I had a, a similar experience, not like in Boston, Boston, I was still cool. I kept my cool, but mm. did you feel like, man, my, I broke my brain. I'm never, yeah, this is I how like, it is was permanently a, now. I'm fucked. It was like a level of hysteria that I thought would just never be reversed. Like I was oh. willing to die there. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, take me out now. 
Yeah, yeah. That's scary. I've had better experiences since, but that was a pretty bad tone setter. And it took me a while to, to get comfortable with the idea again. Last one, we'll end on a really funny one, I think. Well, that mm. one was funny, but we'll end on like a, a truly nothing better than a shitting your pants story, but worse yet, oh, hell yeah. you do it intentionally. <laughs> So. <laughs> no, no, Maddie. Yeah. Oh no! Yeah, if you want to no. hear something galaxy brained? I, I as a kid was forced into sports, right? And I love sports now. It's funny, but as a kid, a video game loving kid who just wanted to, you know, watch anime and, just, and draw. Like I was all into artsy shit. Like <laughs> throwing me on a baseball team. It's funny because I actually wasn't that bad either. Like I think if I really hung with it, I could have been pretty good. Um, but. You know, I, I had to go to practice, especially on weekdays and shit. So I remember uh, my my grandma drove me to practice this day and we get there. You know, we're, we're doing our warm ups and everything. This is this had to be fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade. You know, What's I'm sport? old enough to make a decision here, but not a smart one. What sport? Uh, baseball. Oh, OK. Mm-hmm. Baseball. Yeah. Sorry. And you know, so we're doing our warm ups and I'm like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. And so I, I remember going to my coach. I'm like, hey, I got to use the bathroom. He's like, use the woods. I'm like, it's like, no, sir. And I was like, it's uh, number two. And he's like, oh, he's like, go check if the school is unlocked. So there's like a side entrance and a front entrance. And I was like, okay, I go to a side entrance. It's locked. And I don't know what happened psychologically because we've all had these moments where we really got to go to the bathroom and like you get to the moment of like, if this door cracks open, you know, we're right there. But if it, it locks and it doesn't open up, you immediately like that process is now hastened a little bit. So now you like, I really got to go. So I go, you know, I have my grandma, I go to, go to the front of the car. I'm like, Hey, can you drive me to the front of the school? She does that front of the school is locked too, which is crazy. By the way, this is like the afternoon, like the janitors are there. So I don't know why it's locked up oh, tight, but man. it is. Uh, so I tell my coach, I'm like, Hey, we got to, I was like, I got, I got to go home. Cause I like, I have to go to the bathroom. I had to like fight tooth and nail my grandma to do this, by the way. Cause I was just like, you no, know, like, I got to go to the bathroom. Now, my grandma's like, okay, we'll go to the bathroom and go back. Now, in my head, I'm like, I don't want to go back. I was like, I don't want to. I was like, I have, a, I have a golden opportunity. We just got to practice. We're like five minutes in. It's usually like an hour and a half, two hours, and I can be out of here now. So what do I do? I decide, well, what if I just shit my pants right fucking here in this car in sliding shorts nonetheless? Oh, no. And I just make a big stink literally out of it. And maybe because I've made such a mess out of it, I just can't go back. So I just tell my grandma, like, so I just sit there. I'm just like, fuck it. So I just shit my pants straight up. (laughs) (laughs) I tell my grandma, she's like, oh, no, no. Yeah. So, you know, it's a whole horrible situation here. We get home and she, you know, I clean up everything. I'm like, yeah, I guess I can't. She's like, what do you mean? You got to go back. I'm like, I just shit my pants. What do you mean? She's like, no, you like, you're not sick or something. You know, you cleaned up everything. So not only did my hair brain scheme not work out, I shit myself and get dragged back to practice for the last hour after all no. of this. So my plan did not pay off. I did that one of the dumbest through. things imaginable as a kid. I, w- I risked it all. I got nothing out of it. <laughs> so yeah, those are some of my, my hair brain schemes that I can think of all the top of my dome here that, that have not paid off well for me. Oh, that, dude. That being potentially the crown jewel. Matty, this reminds me, I just saw it was like on Instagram. And I think these these are usually like reposts from TikTok. But there was a one that was like, hey, you don't want to you want to go home from work? Just shit your pants. What are they going to do? <laughs> like, if I didn't want to do this podcast anymore, I just and I just shit myself. Actually, in this situation, I could just tell you guys I shit myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. No one's going to question that. <laughs> you may have. We wouldn't know. Yeah, you and I just be you like might be I gotta, sitting in a mound of poop right now. No one knows. That's the beauty, yeah. right? Dude, so Matt, shitting uh, your pants is code red. It's like anything yeah. goes. Someone shits their pants, dude. Like whatever, you cover <laughs> yeah. them no matter what. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my but grandma Matt, didn't the, have my back there though. She forced me back into practice. Yeah, that was ruthless, dude. <laughs> yeah, shower, <That> shower, <laughs> and it was it was over. She's like, here's new sliding shorts because I had multiple pairs. She, she had an answer for everything because my parents knew I was probably trying to get out of it so they, they had her prepared, even for Code Red. Yeah, nice try. We've done that too. We tried to pull that one. <laughs> the old shit when we were growing up. Around. <laughs> so, <laughs> Betty, long... <laughs> did you mention like when you got there, you're, did you say anything to your teammates or like... I remember the coach looking at me because he was just like, you know, 
then where the fuck are you where are you bro because i was gone for like you know it was a two-hour practice right so i was gone for like an hour of it throughout this whole ordeal and he was like you know go ahead and line up but like afterwards he, he asked me like you know where were you and you know I, nowadays in hindsight I, I i wish current me was there to stand next to little me and be like are you fucking serious bro like i had to take a dump like what do you think fucking happened like i, I was drowning <laughs> in it like but anyway i had to explain to him that i was like yeah i i just had to go home and go to the bathroom and i told him what happened <laughs> i didn't tell him straight up like i did this deliberately i was like yeah i kind of didn't make it had to change his stuff he's like oh okay you know i'm sorry to hear that thanks for coming back i was like yes yeah, Thanks, dude. Great, great to be here. <laughs> Maddie, you legitimately know, I think of all of the many poop stories I've heard in my life, you've provided two of some of the best. The Hall of yeah, Fame. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, the brick wall. Yeah, and the, then, the, 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 poop, the, the grass wiping. Yeah, yeah the grass wiping. Oh, with the grass. Well, you for that. What, with grass? I mean, maybe you should just tell it again. Right, I had no choice. Yeah, I guess. Do I, I, yeah, know. I might as well. You do what you yeah, now you have please. to. Fuck. Oh, some man. Duke listeners have heard it. But it's a it's an all timer. I mean, it definitely is an all timer story. <laughs> Finding Dookie, and, and unfortunately, this is a story that was into my college years, so I don't really have a good Less excuse. excuse. Yeah, Less like excuse. at least as a kid, I could say I lacked rationale. But like when I was this age, I was like, this was this was survival mode. We talked yeah. about it, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I was at a Mets game with an ex now, and and uh, we. You know, we, we I ate all the foods that shouldn't just be combined together because it's just a mush pie in the making, bro. And mm-hmm. it was like hot dogs, like the ice cream sundaes, just <gasps> piling it on, dude. Popcorn, just everything getting thrown in the stomach. Not considering that I had an almost like from from City Field at that time, like maybe an hour and a half ride back to her place afterwards. I was like, this is bad. And not only that, but that particular stretch people who have gone to city field and hit this road afterwards know that you hit this first set of bathrooms like and then it is a 30 40 mile or maybe i'm I'm not sure the mile count but it's a very long stretch of time before you see another building an exit you can pull off of that sure, gets yeah. you to a, a place of safety so after eating all of this food we leave the game. The Mets won. This is actually one of the best Mets games in history. Like they still talk about it to this day. So I'm having a great fucking night, right? But as we're walking back to the car, you get that twist in your stomach. You're like, oh, fuck. Shit. Like, yeah, oh, I'm like, I'm not oh. even in the, I'm not even in, in the car yet. And we're, we have an hour and a half ahead of us. And you just know this is going to be not good. So I get in the car. I'm like, all right, let's just hold it. Because <laughs> that's going to work. <laughs> that's worked in the past. Um, so I'm like, all right, let's get in the car. Let's hold it. You know, I'm, I'm hoping if I look at my phone, distract myself, I was going to look up like fallout videos and stuff. I was like, yeah, if I just engage my, my brain, I won't focus on this. So we get in the car and, you know, this relationship was like set enough where there was comfort, but not new enough where I could say in front of her and her sister, by the way, oh. like, oh, yeah, I got to like, guys, hold up. Like, I still had to maintain this cool persona, you know, be, you know, consider the level of attraction there, not be a gross little guy here so um you know when we're driving along i'm like yeah i know i can't hold this so i tell uh my my, uh, my girlfriend at the time i'm like uh, hey can you pull over uh, i say i just i have to pee like i, I you know again i'm the, the humility is clearly there i'm not gonna out myself yet uh so we pull over into this lone dunkin donuts and i walk up to the dunkin donuts and it's locked remember what i mentioned like you know i it was like I was brought back to this story, funny enough, with my grandma. I pulled the lock. I'm like, like it feels like the meters went here to here. It's like, okay, like your 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 muscles are are on a thread now. I look around, I'm like, okay, the 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 Dunkin' Donuts is locked. This employee walks up, is yelling at me through the glass, like, you can't come in. I'm like, can I just use your bathroom? As I'm trying to yell at him, he's like, No. I'm like, I can't use your bathroom. He's like, No. I'm like, dude, there's nowhere else to go. He's like, porta potty. So I run over to the porta potty, and that's fucking padlocked. And I'm like, dude, Rude. this is bad. Oof. So I go and tell my girlfriend, I'm like, hey, uh, I said, uh, both bathrooms are locked. I said, I'm just going to go in the woods over there and just <laughs> figure the rest out. And so I said, there, I say, hey, if you don't mind, just wait here. Right. So <laughs> in my head, I'm walking towards this patch of the woods and I'm like, I don't I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have a plan at all, but I got to just do something quick. <laughs> so. It's as if God spawned this like a Fortnite wall, man. So I walk to this area and I'm sure it's still there. Actually, someone wrote in about it. If you go to this Dunkin' Donuts, this brick wall 
is still there. It is just a solo <laughs> brick wall in a patch of grass, perfectly placed to hide me from. There was no drive through windows on the left side of the building. It was dark out. No one was pulling around. I was like in a safe area where I was like, it's now or never. So I do what any survivalist does. I drop my pants. I take a dump right there in the patch of grass. And now phase two comes to mind. Like I feel that relief and I'm like, I did it. I'm like, dude, we're good. And I'm like, wait, I, like, I got to fucking wipe. I was like, I got to, there's a cleanliness factor to this, man. Oh yeah. And, and wait till you hear one part of the story where it just goes from bad to worse. Cause it's not even at the worst yet. So <laughs> so I just grabbed some grass and patches. I'm like, dude, again, survivalist. Like I'm on like naked and afraid. I'm like, fuck it. So I'm just using the grass. And as I'm using it, I start to see these headlights peering around the wall. And dude, like I'm standing there like a caveman <laughs> out here. I'm just like, I'm like, oh shit. So yeah. I, you know, I, I pick everything up as if I'm I'm like, you know, just finishing taking a whiz. And <laughs> She's like, oh, you were back here for a while. I just want to make sure you were okay. I was like, and and her sister's like, I told her not to do it because who knows what else you were doing. But I think her sister read the room better than her of like what was actually going on yeah, here. Sure. And um, and so I'm like, all right, well, I feel this imme- immense relief. I didn't get caught. They at least my girlfriend, the one who matters here at the time, is you know she thinks I was just peeing and that was it. So I get in the car and I'm I'm worried a little bit, right? I've not really properly cleaned up. I use slimy grass. Yeah. And so I'm kind of sitting there like legs clenched together, ass clenched, just like polite as, you know, as a, as a nun in church. And what happens that makes it worse is like, I'm worried that like, you know, when most people smell, they can't smell themselves, but other people can smell how bad they are. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm worried this is what's happened to me. I'm just like, man, like what if I just got in the car and I just fucking reek immediately, right? So I'm sitting there. No one's really saying anything or acting different or kind of exchanging funny looks. So I'm thinking I'm safe. And maybe I wasn't. And that was a story for another time. But her sister goes, man, I'm tired and kicks the whole seat all the way back flat. So her head is like right next to where my ass is. And I'm like, no, no. no. I was like, no. why? And I'm like waiting for her to the only moment of comfort is that she never picked her head back up. She, ne- you know, she never like sat back up as in like, like, ah, never mind. She just stayed down there and fell asleep. And I'm like, okay, I must be fine. But nonetheless, that is the conclusion of one of Maddie's iconic tales. Dude, wow. That is insane. Yeah. yeah. I could feel the anxiety from that whole scenario. Yeah. yeah. Good Lord. Yeah. What a so nightmare. Nervous. It was literally do or die. Like I, yeah. it's it's a great story to share, but in that moment, it was like, dude, you just I had to go full survivalist. Every bathroom locked, a convenient yeah, what can brick you do? wall. Yeah, it's a it's a hilarious mental image to watch me go through all this. But in that moment, there was no greater panic in my life than right then and there. It was yeah, terrifying. Humanity should never be put in that position. Yeah, it's just it's unthinkable. I've always said that someone should just make an invention that allows you to like. Like, what if you had, this is crazy thought, but like you had something connected to your body that just let you crap yourself, but it shot out like flowery scents. Like, why does it have to smell bad? Like, why can't mm, we, yeah. why do we always need a toilet? We why, could do it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like, get it, on it's, Elon. Make yeah. That shit. That's what I was thinking too. <laughs> Dude, man, I always, I think with the story, like how, you know, in the, in the timeline, the multiverse, there's a version where the, they came around the corner and you've got like, <laughs> And a I got patch caught. of grass in your hand and your your ass out over your, your dump. And, <laughs> Fudgy like grass. You, you really dodged the bullet there. I, I, think. I swear someone was looking out for me that night because that was like between the brick wall and that millisecond moment of like seeing the headlights. Like you think about those two not being there or that, as you mentioned, like a second later, right? I noticed a second later. It's a whole different story, right? I've now been caught pants down. I've got to explain myself. I'm instantly maybe less attractive. Maybe I'm more funny. Who knows what happens there, right? Yeah. Does that bring me closer to her and her sister? You never know. Um, it's so, dodged yeah. a bullet. Maybe it man. was a phantom poop. Like it didn't leave anything. <laughs> oh, you, yeah. You that would have been fortunate, lucky, right? One uh, of those ones that doesn't leave a doesn't leave yeah. a trace. But it's never going to be that. In that I, I couldn't imagine with what I ate that night. I mean, dude, it was it was Lord, like a bear shit. Was in the looking woods, out man. For it was you, crazy. <laughs> yeah, there is a god. Yeah, he shined upon you that night. It could have ended a lot worse, my friend. I mean, listen, 
If you guys are satisfied, I mean, there's one story I, I thought of while you guys were speaking. It's such a regrettable story. I feel almost bad for saying it, but it's one of those bad idea things that's so funny because it was just repeated bad ideas and which encouraged you until you realize how bad it could go. And it could have went a lot worse. But basically, it's a really short one. My, I got my driver's license. It was that period between getting my driver's license but having my own car. So my dad benevolently let me drive his car whenever he wasn't using it. I remember he had a brand new Eddie Bauer edition Ford Explorer. It was like a pretty early SUV. He was so proud of it. And for whatever reason, he let me use it. He trusted me with it. And we would just go on little jaunts to like Taco Bell or something like that. Like I wasn't driving that much. I might even have my junior license at the time. But we found a road near my house, which was kind of out of the way. And it was just like industrial parks and stuff. And we found out like after five o'clock, it was practically dead down there. But there was a jump. And you could just, you could go as fast as you wanted if you went in the evening and just do this jump, which was like near, I don't know if it was over a railroad track crossing. Or if it was just near one, but you could just get air off this jump. So 17-year-old, 18-year-old thing, and I'm not thinking like I'm going to crash this car. But I do remember when you jumped, you had to maintain speed. You couldn't jump it too quick because you had to quickly turn like it veered right after you landed. Mm. So I would do this thing all the time just on the way home. All right, we're going to do the jump. Everybody gets psyched and it would go good. And <laughs> you know, it would get maybe a little sketchy, but never got serious. One day- I do the jump, dude, and it was like a cartoon. I'm in the air, and it just cuts to slow mo. I remember this so well. There's a family of partridges. I never had never even seen a partridge in my entire life. There's a family of partridges crossing the street, like a mom partridge and three oh, or four no. little partridges. And I'm like, it was like a Castlevania thing. It was like you wanted to turn, but you were in midair. You couldn't. Mm-hmm. There was no way. I was just all four wheels are off the ground. So I was like, oh my God. So in that flash, I hit whatever, you know, I, I'm going so fast that I don't even know what the fallout was, but it was just a, it was just a flurry of feathers fly up. And I'm like, oh my God. And not only that, but I was going so quickly that I skid out in some sand and like stopped the car swerving, like literally, I'm not even exaggerating, like an inch away from a tree because I was so, I was so shaken up about the partridges or pheasants, whatever they were. I think they were partridges. And I never, I was so, it was, I think it was the first time I got the sense of like, oh my God, like what, what was I even thinking about? You know what I mean? Like I had done this countless times. Who knew? It could have been a person crossing the road. It could have been a deer. Who knew? It could have ended up so bad. It was the first time I ever had pause where I was like, Mm. oh shit, what you're doing is totally asinine. Like it's so idiotic. You know what I mean? That whole thing could have crashed my dad's with however much money car that was at that point. It was so, it's so crazy, but that's the thing. Like you don't have that when you're a kid until something happens. You don't have that limiter yeah. on you. It's like that rev limiter, right? Where it's like, I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want. It doesn't matter. No, what could possibly go wrong? You know, that type of thing. Dude, it's so, the, the bad idea thing is just, I don't know. It's like an infinite it's well for me. Topic. I feel like it's yeah. a great topic. Over 50 years, I don't think I've ever not had one, right? Like every oh. year that I've existed, it's always been something. Yeah. I had um, a little What do you guys think? The, Are you guys satisfied with that one? I had one more that, uh, it's, oh, it's, please. Such, a, it's such a small, it's mm. such a small one. It might not even be worth sharing, but I just remembered like it was, it was that moment of you think you're invincible because you're young. <laughs> I used to play hockey every Thursday and Saturday. I remember before a Thursday game, uh, my friends and I got sushi and I was just like, yeah, it's great. Like I love sushi, you know, fuel up for the game. Like in my head, I'm doing the right thing. Dude, I have never burped up more food in my life <laughs> on the ice <laughs> during that game. It was horrible. <laughs> yeah, Dude, that was another really bad idea. Yeah, that I uh, I ate crazy bread for breakfast once before school, and oh. uh, like all day I could just like any little burp. It was like just garlic. I was like, yeah. oh no! It was oh. kind of like with the I was like, <laughs> someone am I like imbuing garlic scent? <laughs> everywhere that's awesome gotta be careful with that you gotta be careful dude now yeah. maddie the sushi wasn't bad you just ate too much or yeah, was the wrong thing to eat? yeah i just ate that. too much like i i always get three Hockey, rolls right? i have for years like that's my that's always my play with sushi three rolls like usually california spicy tuna and like a salmon avocado roll 
And that's fine, I think. Maybe not before athletic activities. Right. No, no, no. That doesn't mix. No. You will will be tasting that for hours on end. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my friends, here we are. I mean, we made it. Legendary episode. Yeah. I mean, that was that was super fun. I mean, listen, I want to thank you guys. Let's circle the table, visit with these knights of the round one last time as we eyeball the door over here. Dust, goodbye, my friend. Thank you. Goodbye. This has been fun. It's fun to shake up the formula a little bit. Not that it's that crazy. Just no calling, but uh, mm-hmm. definitely a different feel. So this has been fun. I uh, I think... I don't think I have anything going on tonight. So I think it's just going to mm. be rebirth and chill yeah, all right. night. And I'm very excited for it. But yeah, this has been super fun. And man, guys, we're getting so close to New York City. Uh, right Matt, there. You're going to PAX. So you're doing some traveling too, right? Yes. I have an anniversary trip next week. PAX the week after. So I'm giving, giving my travel muscles a little bit of a, a run here and seeing how we do. And then I should be able to start traveling with you guys afterwards and, you know, provide everything goes well here. So it's a big test. So I'm, I'm excited for it. Nice. nice. Very yeah. cool. But thanks. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for the hangouts has been real. Oh, Love it was it. fun. What a crew. What a crew this was. Brad, my Yo. friend, thank you so yeah. much for joining us. We're so grateful. What about you? Weekend plans? What's what's cooking? Uh, I don't know. I might go outside and do something today because it's very nice out right now. I feel like yeah. I need to just get out there for a little bit. Obviously going to play tons of Rebirth, though, when the sun goes down. No yeah. doubt. Uh, but yeah, thanks for having me on. It was awesome. We started on a very serious and somber note. We ended with poop stories, so I'm feeling <laughs> real good. Happy to make sure everyone's leaving yeah. with a smile on their face. Two That's legendary so- poop stories. <laughs> yeah, <I love> it. <laughs> we run the gamut. Maddie, my friend, instigator <laughs> of the poop stories, yes, sir, and bringer of the poop stories. Thank you, my friend. What What about uh, weekend plans? What's going on Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the Maddie? Since- Maddie plays. Since it's going to be two weeks of travel you now coming up, I'm hoping to lay pretty low this weekend. Whenever I go away, I do have to do some prep ahead of time. So I might do a little weekend work, which I typically don't do. But I echo Dustin's sentiment of a little rebirth and chill. I really want to have that done before I travel Thursday next week. And so that's my goal. So I'm going to put some meaningful hours in uh, this weekend. But yeah, I'm just going to hunker down, play some games, really, just because I know I'm going to be flying a mile a minute for the next two weeks afterwards. So I, I know my game time will dwindle. So that's that's the weekend plans. Should be a good one. That sounds like a good strategy to me. And listen, we won't get into the Moogle discussion right now, Bradley Ellis. We'll talk about, <laughs> we will talk about that at a future, at yeah, a future we have plenty time. To talk about. We need to talk about <laughs> Star Wars still. We got a lot of baggage <laughs> with Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a lot. There's a lot to break down there. Listen. It was so good to spend this time with you three today. Thank you to you fine sirs and for everybody out there enjoying taking this thing for a spin with us. Without dad, (laughs) tell dad we did a great job. Maybe don't mention the whole coup thing. Mm. (laughs) And, you know, I mean, we hope Micah and Colin are having a great time in Beantown. Um, Nice for them to get away and have a little vacation. Listen, they're in good hands, right? We're the consummate professionals. Patreon dot com slash last stand media for early ad free access as always we'll see you next time until then let dagan host goodbye oh (laughs) constellation is a product of last stand media and collins last stand llc and is proudly recorded in the usa the show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me colin moriarty my co-host is my brother dagan moriarty the show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 